Okay, everyone, we're going to start. Okay, we're going to continue with uh, further proponent discussions and, and uh, model presentations. And um, this one's going to be by Dave Moore. This is a suite of SMSIM models. Can we raise the sound? Please, one, two, check. Yes, that's good. Okay, because people stand here is one, two, check. One, two, one, one, one. Hello, one, two. This is too low. That's going to go to this. No, but we don't want people to want to check. Okay. Okay, we're ready. We're going to start this afternoon and continue with uh, proponent models. Dave Moore is going to talk about the SMSIM suite of models. And when we talked about the six models that Gail selected, it was a task she led, but that's a task that the TI team uh, bought on, and we conferred, and we agreed with those six models. We can call them Gail's models, but it's not her proponent's position. It's a TI team uh, approved set of models. Okay, Dave. Yes, can you lower the lights to uh, whatever, 20%? Thank you, Christine. Uh, this will be fairly short, I think. Uh, I want to describe a few things that I've done, um, do some computations with a stochastic model. Um, I really don't have to show this slide because Gail's already talked about it, but it's just the background for the point source stochastic uh, model. And I'm just going to skip right through it. Um, you saw this picture uh, before. As you know, the important thing is specifying the target spectrum, which is in the Fourier amplitude spectrum. And then you assume that that motion is distributed it's, uh, over a, a time duration uh, in a sort of random way. And the time duration is given, uh, the total duration is given as a sum of a source duration plus a path duration. And then from that, you can either use time domain simulations or random vibration calculations to compute the ground motion intensity measures. Uh, in this uh, presentation, I've used random vibration uh, simulations. The parameters that you need for stochastic simulations, it's important to have a good um, idea of what's required and what's being used uh, for consistency. Uh, in particular, in this case, I'm going to be deriving the stress parameter from data uh, using all the other parameters. And so th in doing forward calculations, I have to use the same parameters that I used in doing that inversion. There are frequency independent parameters, uh, density near the source, I'm using 2.8. The shear wave velocity near the source, 3.7. The average radiation pattern, 0 0.55. And you know, a lot of people just use a number like that without thinking about it. But if you change it to 0 0.7, all your numbers, are, all your motions are going to increase by that ratio. The partition factor of motion into two components, I use 0 0.71. And finally, the free surface effect, which I use two. There are frequency dependent parameters. Let's start with the source. There's the shape of the source spectrum, and I'm using in this, uh, an, uh, these calculations a single corner frequency model. And then there's the scaling of the shape with magnitude. Uh, this is controlled primarily by the stress parameter delta sigma, and I'm going to describe uh, how I've derived that for these calculations. And then we have the path and the site. Um, geometrical spreading and Q, they're correlated, and we were given those, and so I'll be using those six models. Uh, the duration, the path duration uh, is needed in converting the Fourier acceleration spectra into the response spectra. And uh, I'm using some results from a new analysis by Eric Thompson and myself. Then crustal amplification, because we're computing in a forward way the motions all the way from the source step up to the surface. And I'm going to show uh, the crustal amplification model that I'm using. It's a somewhat revised model compared to what I've used before. And then finally, the site uh, diminution uh, parameter, I'm using kappa, kappa zero of 0.006, that was provided. 
I'm doing random vibration calculations, and there are a number of parameters that have to be used in that. Uh, one that, that's very important is <coughs> an adjustment to the root mean square duration that's used, and this is um, results that I'm using are based on new results by Eric and myself. Uh, the equation for the, uh, the peak motion relative to the RMS, uh, what we call the RMS to peak factor, uh, I used to use uh, Cartwright and Logge Higgins in uh, 1958, and now I'm using uh, some results from Dirk Rigian and Van Mark. So that's new, although it really doesn't make much difference because the DRMS that you get is dependent on the RMS to peak factor that you use. And then finally, the finite fault adjustment, which is, uh, as Gail and Emra showed you, is very important. And that's uh, being able to convert the, the distance to the rupture surface to what I call RPS for point source. It's an equivalent point source distance. Um, I'm using a combination of Yenier and Atkinson 2015 and their equation for um, 2014, although I would actually prefer just to use the 2015 if I had to redo this. This just shows this uh, factor in the bottom. You can see the equation that gives you the, uh, the point source distance as the square root of the sum of the squares of the distance to the rupture surface. And then this h, or finite fault factor, uh, which is a function of magnitude uh, squared. And the, the graph shows a various h um, as a function of magnitude that have been proposed, Atkinson Silva 2000, uh, Atkinson and Bohr uh, 03. Uh, the one that I'm using in here, which I probably shouldn't have used, is, is given by the red, and that's just a combination of the two YA 14 and 15s. The path duration, let's talk about that. This is somewhat new. Um, Garrick and I have just published a paper in the bulletin where we looked at the Western data, and the analysis uh, that we're using now for the Eastern is the same kind of analysis. In the SM SIM program, I had really forgotten, I, back in 19... 83, if I, I look carefully at my paper, I had uh, assumed that the duration is given by the, uh, the Hewson plot and looking at the duration between the, the 0 0.95 or the 95% and the 5% duration. And this was done uh, so that the envelope function um, had the same duration as the excitation, the, the path plus the source duration. When we started to analyze the data, we realized that often <clears throat> that 95 minus 5 gave you um, an over, the durations you're getting are a little bit longer than you probably should, uh, would have used, and this is illustrating that. This is a, the second graph down is an actual time series from an earthquake. The top graph is a Hewson plot. You can see they're fairly strong P waves, and if you use the 95 to 5, you can get a longer duration than you should because you're getting uh, P wave energy. So what we found is that if we use the 80 minus 20 duration and we multiply it by 2, we get a good approximation to the, the, the duration that we would like. So this is the duration measure that we have in our function, and it's very specific to the SMSM program. Other people like 75 minus 5 or 70 minus 5. We're just used, I just want you to be clear we're using 80 minus 20 times 2. And this is the duration function we come out with. We've uh, subtracted off a kind of a generic source duration, but we're using fairly small earthquakes, so it doesn't really matter too much. And the D95 prime duration minus the source duration is given, that we're using now, is given by that blue, solid blue curve. The data are, showing, are shown by the symbols, and the very light sort of cyan are individual data points but then we have, we've computed uh, median values in different magnitude bands, and we're guided primarily by the magnitude four to five data. So you can see that <clears throat> it's a, a fairly strong increase with distance to a pretty long duration, like uh, 25 seconds at 50 kilometers, and then it increases. Now in comparison, the, uh, the red curve down below is the duration that uh, Gail and I have used back in 1995. So you see it's quite different. Um, also, the duration that Eric and I have just recently published for Western North America, or active uh, crustal regions, is given by the gray curve. So it's also um, fairly short. So the eastern durations seem to be very long compared to the, uh, the western durations. And this has a, a quite a large impact on the ground motions because you're assuming that the energy in the Fourier acceleration spectra is being spread out over a longer time duration than we were using before, which means that the ground motions will actually decrease. 
This is the same plot, it's just going out to a greater distance, out to 900 kilometers. So we have a lot of data, a lot of good data, and uh, it's clearly a very long uh, duration. Crustal amplification that we have to use. Um, on the left, the, the black curve is the uh, shear wave velocity versus depth for the bore joiner 97 very hard rock profile that we used. And I've simply uh, replaced the uppermost material by something with 300 um, meters a second, uh, 3,000 meters a second, because that's the condition, the BS30 condition that we have. And then the, uh, the colored one, kind of the, the brown curve, is one model that was provided to me from the uh, NGA East project, just to give you an idea of how the generic profile compares to a specific profile. And then the right-hand curve shows the amplifications that we're using. Um, again, the brown corresponds to the specific profile that was uh, provided to us, and the solid black is the actual amplification that we're using. So it's not big. You can see it's 1.15 at the higher frequencies. Now, that amplification has no kappa in it. And if you put in the kappa of 0.006, the operator, you can see by the dotted curve what the actual amplifications are. The stress parameter, of course, is probably the key thing here. And uh, what I've done is I've used the data um, and the procedures that um, in two papers that I published in 2010 and 2012 to obtain delta sigma for each attenuation model by actually inverting the PSA at two periods, 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 seconds from nine Eastern North American earthquakes. These are the earthquakes right here. Um, some, you know, you recognize a number of these. Um, I have made no attempt, I've got to tell you, I didn't have time to go into the, the latest flat file for NGA East and, and redo this. I probably should do that because the data may be uh, better. But I just used the data that I used in my previous papers. And the idea here is to uh, actually do a formal inversion of the response vector. So you compute the theoretical response vector for a whole range of stress parameters and then you find the stress parameter that gives you the best fit to the observed uh, response spectra. Uh, just to get an idea of how the, uh, uh, the various attenuation models will fit the response spectra, I'm showing here for the Riviera du Lou uh, data for 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 1, and 2 seconds, I'm showing the response spectral values and then the predicted values, in this case for the Atkinson Bohr 14 model, um, for a range of stress parameters, and you probably can't read it, I can barely read it, but that range goes from 25 bars to 25,600 bars. So it's a big, big range right here. And one uh, thing that, oh, underneath the AB14, you can see a little thing that indicates what that attenuation model is. In this case, it basically falls off as one over uh, R to the 1.3, out to 50 kilometers, and then it's one over the square root of R beyond that. So it's basically a, a, a minus 1.3 model. And you can see from this that for the longer periods, you simply cannot, it doesn't matter what stress parameter you use, you're not going to be able to predict the motions at longer periods. This is something we actually recognized in our 2010 paper, and there's a quote. The near source observations at longer periods for this earthquake are inconsistent with the magnitude of, of 4.7 if an attenuation of R to the minus 1.3 is assumed to continue all the way back to the source. The same thing is true of the, um, that was the AB14 model, but the BCA10A model is also an R to the minus 1.3 model, and we have the same uh, problem with the longer periods. The other models are basically R to the minus 1, with one exception. And here's BCA10D, and now you can see that um, there's more hope of finding a stress parameter that allows you to predict the uh, response vector at many periods from short periods to long periods with the same stress parameter. Uh, this is BS11, uh, Boatwright and Seekins 11, which really is my favorite model of all of those. And uh, also superimposed in this, uh, just for interest, is the Atkinson Bohr 06 predictions and then the modifications we published in 2011. Uh, this is the Joiner 97 model which is R to the minus 1 out to 70, then it's flat to 130, and then, then 1 over the square root of R. Uh, again, you can do a pretty good job of predicting uh, the data from this particular earthquake over a wide range of periods. And this is SO2SC, 
And here the, uh, the attenuation rate is uh, dependent on magnitude. And uh, for magnitude 5, it turns out it's r to the minus 1.1 uh, in the first 80 kilometers. So I've done a, a formal inversion of not just this data, the Riviera de Lu, but of the nine earthquakes. And these are the results I get. So I have six graphs here, uh, one for each attenuation model. And I'm showing uh, the delta sigma that I've derived as a function of moment magnitude for the earthquakes. And I have two sets, one in blue and one in red, because in one case I did inversions of data only within 200 kilometers because I noticed it was really hard to match data beyond that. And if you did that, you would tend to uh, not match the data at closer distances. So I've looked at the inversions for R less than 200 and R less than 600. And I'm actually using in the simulations that I'll show you uh, R less than 200. So you can see uh, how important the distance is. And you can see there's a wide variation in the actual derived delta sigmas depending on what the attenuation model is. So some results. Uh, this just shows for the BS11 model, it shows the predictions of the 0.1 second response vector as a function of distance to the rupture surface uh, for the four uh, magnitudes, five through eight. And I have similar plots that I will not show uh, for the other, uh, the other models and other periods. This shows, um, now, for individual magnitudes, it shows all of the models and the predictions of 0.1 seconds as a function of distance. And it's hard to see a lot of details here. But notice they kind of pinch together for the magnitude 5 and 6 at about um, something like 50 to 100 or 200 kilometers. And that's because we've chosen the delta sigma to match the data. And most of the data are at those distance ranges or even beyond right here. Probably more informative. Oh, and I should say that when you look at these, the dash curves are the two r to the minus 1.3 models. And you can see that they're high. It's easier to see this if you make a plot like this, which is at uh, the simulations are done at a r rough of 10 kilometers. This is 0 0.01 seconds. And I'm showing for the six models the response vector as a function of uh, magnitude. And again, the r to the, the 1.3 models are given by the dash line. So you can see they're high. And uh, by the way, the red line is kind of interesting. That is the uh, SC, uh, SO2 SC model. And uh, I was quite concerned when I saw this, when I made this uh, figure yesterday, about what, what's going on there. And I think it's real. And what's happening is that uh, if you go to bigger magnitudes because of this, this H, that converts the closest distance to the rupture to the point source distance, which you're actually using in all of your simulations, H increases. So it's something like 30 kilometers for a magnitude 8. At the same time, in their model, the geometrical spreading uh, actually decreases. The slope of the geometrical spreading decreases as you get to larger magnitudes. And so I think it's a combination of these two things that's, that's uh, causing this uh, large increase uh, for their model. I have a similar plot for 0 0.2 seconds, and it looks quite similar. And then finally, for one second. And that's it. Any questions? You don't have to stop. Your duration that you're now using, so 2 times the 80 minus 20, right? The, the, you change the duration to be 2 times the 80 is 80 minus 20. Is that calibrated from matching the, the response spectral values? Uh, no, that's Can you use the microphone? Okay, no, sorry. No, uh, the question was whether the duration you're using was, was calibrated to try to match response spectral values. It, it's not. We were uh, using the duration, and we did sim simulations with SM Sim, and we found that if we use two times a minus 20, we gave, got the same duration as the SM Sim 95 minus 5. Okay, and the SM Sim doesn't have these problems with the P wave and in the late aftershocks and stuff extending things. Okay. Got it. Okay. And then 
should, from the plots that you have showing the, the data and that at the longer periods you are not matching using 1.3, does that mean you can, should you or, and can you use a frequency dependent geometrical spreading? Is that what that means we should be doing so that you have a, a minus one at, at, at low frequencies and a 1.2 or 3 at high frequencies? Actually, AB14 has that. It, it actually has a, a frequency dependent geometrical spreading, but it wasn't enough to deal with that. And Gail is behind you raising her hand, so she can answer that. I'll just make a further comment on that. But, you know, that was one of the reasons why we went, why we wanted to break this. You know, what we end up with is, is a situation here where we're casting what I think should probably go into an overall calibration constant into the geometric spreading rate, right? In that, as Dave points out, with a lot of those earthquakes, you, you can't match the, um, the, the data if you use all of those assumed constants, which, as he also pointed out, I mean, you could change some of them. Maybe the radiation pattern isn't 0.55. Maybe it has some other value. So if, if you stop thinking of the C as being a magical fixed number and instead allow it to be a parameter that calibrates, then that changes everything. Because if you can shift that curve up and down, you know, I think attenuation, what you really want to ask yourself is, is the attenuation trend right, not is the level right, because that's not attenuation. That's the level. So I, I guess to answer your question, I think it would be the wrong, the, the, you know, even though we essentially did that in AB 14, right? We said, well, we think this is what the attenuation is, but we, we want to make some empirical adjustment up or down to match the level of the data without necessarily think, saying that we think that that's um, attenuation. And so, um, you know, I guess that's really getting at your, your question is rather than making the attenuation frequency dependent as a construct to fix the level, uh, I think you should fix, you shouldn't change the attenuation just to monkey with the level. So then is that the same type of thing where Bob there was, was changing the moment, which is the same thing as changing the level in a frequency dependent way in some sort of a thing? Yeah, so Bob was essentially doing a similar thing in that allowing them the moment to change, right? And if you if you throw away the moment, then you know again you wouldn't have that problem, right? You would say that the data would prefer a different moment for that event. So another way to solve the problem would be to say um, we won't be constrained by using the fixed moment magnitudes. We'll allow the moment magnitude to be determined also. On the other hand, uh, the R to the minus one model seemed to work pretty well without putting in a fudge factor or changing the moment or anything like that. So I think that a really important question is, what is the evidence for the R to the minus three, 1.3? And should we go with that if it's really strong evidence for it? If so, I, I still think that there's some basic um, uncertainties or, or inconsistencies between the data and the models right here. Yeah, I have two points. One is about the geometrical spreading. I, I think a lot of that's contaminated by radiation effects, radiation pattern effects at the low, low frequencies, and I'll show that in my talk again. But I wanted to ask you about the duration, and we've talked about this, the physical meaning of duration and how we use it, because uh, we're measuring basically the scattered energy that's coming in after the S wave. And that's not the direct arrival. That's presumably from ray paths that are slightly different or takeoff angles that are slightly different. So what you're doing is, is assuming that the energy in the direct S wave is distributed throughout that envelope. But that's not correct. That energy is coming from different takeoff angles. And so I'm bothered by this um, lack of physicality in the, in the model. Yeah, actually, Anne-Marie uh, Balte and Tom Hanks uh, gave me, uh, they hassled me about the same thing some time ago. And I started to think about it, and I just don't know how to really simply uh, allow for that, where the, the waves are leaving different parts of the focal sphere and trying to account for all of that. So that's why I'm just keeping this very simple model and, and trying to be self-consistent in the model and 
and that's what I've done. So I agree, there's a lot of things, you know, with the source, with the directivity, I and mean, we've seen that in a number of the earthquakes we have here, and then the whole issue of what does duration mean, that's just, you know, in terms of the physics, but as you pointed out a long time ago, this is a kindergarten model, and it seems to work pretty well. I think we have two. Um, so I guess I have the same question as before lunch. So the attenuation rates that you were talking about, whether it's minus one, minus 1.3 or whatnot, are all on Fourier amplitudes. And the results you showed are all on PSAs. So somewhere in there you're making a conversion from one to the other. It wasn't clear to me how you're doing that. Oh, well, it, that's a fundamental part of the, of the procedure because you're taking the Fourier acceleration spectra and deriving what the target spectrum is at a given distance. So all of the attenuation and the Q and everything are, are being applied. And then to convert that to a ground motion intensity measure is the essence of the stochastic method. Okay. So you're where you're assuming that, that the energy in the Fourier acceleration spectra is distributed uh, randomly over some duration. And that's right. the key right there. Okay. And you can then either use time domain or, or, or random vibration simulations to convert um, one to the other. The, the essence of the random vibration is you use Parseval's theorem, which relates the, the RMS of the source spectrum, or of the, of the target spectrum, to the RMS of the time domain. Uh, just a question about the site corrections when you were doing the comparison with the data. You might have mentioned it. I apologize. I, I missed that. Could you just go back over that again when you're actually doing the comparisons against the recorded motion? Yeah, well, you know, I'm making the assumption that all the, the data are on very hard rock sites. So I'm using a generic very hard rock uh, amplification uh, in the model. I'm making no attempt to go in and looking on the site-by-site -site basis and coming up with uh, a local site response. The big difference between the magnitude scaling with with the Silva O2 and the other models um, is is bothersome right now. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't sure I followed your your explanation. Could you uh, do we know that that's right, Bob or Walt? Have you seen that difference before? It really looked. Can you put that one back? Up? Yeah. Because that's uh, uh, back, back, back. Sorry, where's the back arrow? There it is. Well, here's, let's look at this one, okay? That's the most you know, obvious one, 0.01 CGA. Now, I'll tell you what I, I mean, I saw this. It, it, you know, I actually went into my SM SIM program. I revised things to print out what the effective geometrical spreading was, make sure I was incorporating the magnitude dependence properly. And then this morning here, I did runs where I assumed uh, the specific slope, not a magnitude dependence, and did runs with slope of minus 1.1, minus 1, minus 0 0.9, and I got the same numbers that I was getting here. So for the life of me, I don't know what I could have been doing wrong in, in my simulations. And then uh, I even looked at the, um, the effective geometrical spreading for those different slopes at the distance of, three, of 30 kilometers, and it turns out that uh, the factor I was getting is consistent with 30 to the power either 1.11 1 .1 or 0 0.9. And so remember that even though this is at 10 kilometers rupture distance, the calculations are being done at 30 kilometers, 31.48 kilometers, and therefore d changes in the rate of geometrical spreading are going to be larger than they would be at 10 kilometers. And I mean, I agree, Norm. I saw this yesterday. I said there's got to be something wrong with my program, but I, I can't see that there is at this point. Oh, one other thing I should say. I noticed uh, in, the, uh, in Justin's uh, MATLAB script talking about their, their, uh, the model, the SO2 SC model, that there's actually, in that model, they have a, adjust, a finite fault adjustment factor. It's not the one I was using. So I don't know how their model 
maybe they wouldn't uh, have the same adjustment. And it would be worth checking out. I haven't had a chance to do So that. one thing that we've been trying to do a bit too late for PA, PA requests is to formalize the exact formulations oh. of these six models to make sure it's all consistent. Right. So uh, Rob Graves started right up at making sure that everybody uses the same way, and we'll <coughs> run that by the modelers and making in, sure it's used consistently. In their model, they actually do it in terms of epicenter distance, not closest distance. So a choice has to be made about what the depth is, because they have both the hypercentral depth as well as the additional factors. So that's another thing that somebody has to choose and decide on. Good point. Bob, did you want to reply to that? Or I'm going to talk about it next. Okay. <coughs> but um, in the SO2 model, the G, sorry, the G of R of M was driven by inversions of NGA West 1 data. So it's data driven, but Western US earthquakes. And we plan to redo that again with NGA West 2 models um, when we redo um, the GMPE. And we may also look at Eastern. But in Eastern, it's not big enough magnitude range to probably get much in the way of um, magnitude scaling. So it was, it was data driven at that time. Okay, thank you very much. And on this note, Bob <laughs> is our next speaker. Thank you, Dave. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to talk about a development of a regional hard rock. GMPE for the East. It's a point source model. It was initially done by Walt and Nick and I back in 2002-2003, and we're happy to add Norm to the team uh, for the update. Um, one thing about the update is it's based on the inversions I talked about earlier this morning, and since the inversions are preliminary, I'm just going to talk today about uh, show some results from 2002-2003, and show some upgrades or updated features we hope to incorporate in the next model. Oh. Okay, so the method is based on um, Silva et al. 2003. It's the stochastic PS or point source model. Uh, we're going to talk about the functional form. Uh, H is a function of, of magnitude. Um, H is the uh, saturation depth or point source depth that's been talked about earlier, um, stress drop or stress parameter, uh, and then the prescribed geometric attenuation and Q models. And one of the models we'll look at will be the um, Silva O2 uh, model that came from EPRI 93 that has um, G, the geometric attenuation as a function both of distance and magnitude. Okay, <clears throat> simply we're just going to update the model. Um, we're going to use a lot of point source model validations that Gail talked about this morning, uh, simulations. The inputs we have are the Brun source, crustal amplification, uh, G is a function of R and M in one of the six models, Q and kappa, uh, which uh, crustal amplification and kappa we're going to invert for, and that's partly what we talked about earlier today. Uh, G of R and G of M of R in one model and Q of F are prescribed uh, to us. If we're doing the hard rock model at 3,000 meters per second, uh, kappa naught will be 0 0.06 seconds. Um, we're going to mention the duration model. We use an older model from uh, Herman, and we may update that. We're not sure yet. And then we have two ways to um, get to magnitude saturation. One is using um, constant stress parameter with a saturation or point source depth. The other one is just using a variable stress parameter as a function of magnitude. That will also give you um, saturation. We believe in diversity in our models, so you'll see that um, coming up next. Oops, went the wrong way. So in uh, the O3, there are 11 different models, nine single corner, two double corner based on uh, Atkinson's two corner model. Uh, three stress drops, 
high, medium, and low. We have variable stress drop, constant stress drop, constant stress drop with saturation, and two corner with um, saturation without saturation. So here we're generating 11 models, and if we have six G of R and M and Q pairs, we're looking at um, 66 models. So we hope to fill up this um, space that Norm talked about earlier today with our models. Oops, I keep going the wrong way. Okay, one of the uh, key things is uh, Walt and Norm uh, have spent a lot of work on validating. This is just for the single corner point source model back in 87 and before that from one earthquake in 93. And the results look like this. We're only plotting out to about three seconds. Beyond three seconds, um, there was very little data in the west at this time. The top figure shows uh, model, model bias. And you want to have uh, bias near zero. This is from 14 earthquakes, ranging in moment magnitude from about 5.3 to 7.4. RJB distances are less than 500 kilometers, a combination of both soil and rock sites. You see an overprediction at frequencies less than about one hertz. This was noticed earlier and led to um, Gail and Walt developing a two-corner model for Western U.S. So again, this is just a single, single corner simulation. And this is redundant for what Dave said. Uh, he organized this slide a bit better, uh, but we have both single and double corners, geometric attenuation, Q, kappa, and an associated profile with that. A duration model, we use both constant and variable stress drop or stress parameter. Um, we have two saturation models, and we're looking at frequency range, the classic frequency range. We plan to run a simulation from four, I believe it's now to 8.2, based on this morning, distance from one to 1,000 kilometers, and we're gonna have multiple simulations for moment magnitude and our RJB pairs. Um, in the earlier study, in 2003, we used 300 simulations. We're probably not gonna do that many simulations this time around. Here's one example from the earlier work. Um, it's the one corner variable stress drop model from magnitude seven and a half at a hard rock site, kappa of 0 0.06. It shows the 300 simulations at nine distances from one kilometer out to 400 kilometers. Obviously, we're gonna have to add some distances taking us out to 1,000 kilometers. We may even fill in some distances, but we're probably gonna cut down on the number of simulations. Okay. So this, this goes back to the question asked Dave. Um, for us in the model, we had geometric attenuation as a function of both R distance and moment magnitude. And that was based, was assumed um, based on some inversions of the NGA West 1 GMPEs. We plan to look at the NGA2 West DMPs and do a similar inversion. And then, so that may update the SO2 single corner um, attenuation model that's one of the six models, six recommended models from the TI team. And the other five we're also gonna produce GMPs for. And this is just a summary, We've seen this uh, before. We have the AB14 model with DCA 10A and 10D models, uh, the BS11, uh, Joiner 97, and the final model is the Epri 93, which was used in Silva, Gregor, and Dara. And as you can see, it depends uh, on magnitude and has a, <coughs> an R, and an associated Q model. And we may be revising that with NGA West 2 data. Again, trivially, our kappa for hard rock is six milliseconds. And we're gonna update kappa, not at least for hard rock from the inversions I talked about earlier this morning. Uh, duration model is very simple. It's a smooth distance term, uh, 0 0.05 times R from Herman in 1985. Um, we may update that. We haven't got that far. So what is Examples I'm going to show is we use two magnitude saturation models. One is constant stress parameter, where you change saturation or point source depth or distance. You can also do the same thing using a variable uh, stress drop model. You just decrease the stress parameter with increasing magnitude and you achieve saturation. 
So magnitude saturation for the um, point source distance or saturation depth, this was done in the earlier model based on an, um, looking at the Abraham and Silva 97G MPE and doing an inversion. So we have um, the point source depth as a function of magnitude, which other people have seen it as also as a function of magnitude. We have a simple functional form for it coming from ANS 97. Uh, this, this basically says the same thing. We're going to hopefully update using NGOS 2 models. Um, this shows the inversion um, from NGOS 1, and it shows the four models at that time, Abraham and Silva, Bourne Atkinson, um, Shelly Young and Campbell and Bezorgnia. And for we have a stress drop or stress parameter for M5, 5 and a half, 6 and a half, and 7 and a half. And you can see from our inversions that for all four models, the stress parameter uh, decreases with increasing magnitude. We also give the kappa is down here. And in general, as uh, BS30 increases, kappa decreases. So that was one of the inversions driven by the NJOS1 data that kind of influenced the model for the heat. Uh, the functional form has been um, updated. The first uh, C1 through C5 are in the original model. Uh, C6 is a new term that's been added. And H, again, is the saturation or point source depth. And you can see that is in two terms in the model. So that's the functional form that we're going to use this time around. Now, this is from 2003. This is just to show you. Um, a comparison to PSA for the constant and variable stress drop model at two distances to show you some of the captures, some of the effects, and they're different. <clears throat> so if you look in here and these three distances, there's um, three magnitudes, eight and a half, six and a half, and four and a half, and you have the variable stress drop and the constant stress. Uh, constant stress parameters, 120 bars with depth saturation. You can see here they're very close in the prediction. As you move down in magnitude, they get further and further apart. So there's some scaling with frequency at one kilometer. If you go now to 50 kilometers, if you toggle back and forth, you can see how the models give significantly different predictions now for the eight and a half, and that at this magnitude, they're at the smaller magnitudes, quite a bit closer together. Here at six and a half, they're nearly identical. And this is one of the last slides. This is just uh, PGA, which shows uh, the effect of saturation. Um, the top four curves from eight and a half to four and a half are just PGA without saturation. And the bottom four curves with the symbols show the saturation. So uh, from magnitude four and a half, with and without saturation is essentially the same. Five and a half, six and a half, seven and a half, and eight and a half, you see the most saturation coming in at um, magnitude eight and a half. And this is with the constant stress drop with the point source uh, distance or saturation depth. Sure. So when what Dave just showed, do we know if he's plotting it with saturation or without saturation? I don't Because this have to look. is kind of a similar difference, right? Yeah. Do you have any idea, Dave? I'm not quite sure what your question was, but the plots I showed were plotted versus uh, the rupture distance, not the not the RPS, which was actually used in the calculations. And so behind that is the effect of this H, which is magnitude dependent, that increases the actual distance you're using as you go to bigger magnitudes. But the plots I was making, what, what do you have? That's epicentral distance. So it's very similar to what I was using. Uh, you know, if I had just used 10 kilometers and converted the, the R rupture to a, uh, epicentral. But so I, I think it's a similar thing, actually. Yeah. But the magnitude A is pushed away by, say, 30 kilometers that Dave computed. 
So that's why it drops from the fall line down to the uh, dotted line. Okay, um, this is what the four of us plan to add. We're going to again uh, assess the depth dependence of the stress parameter. We're going to invert the NG West 2 GMPEs for both um, the, the um, point source distance and stress parameter as a function of magnitude. I, I think that the moment and RJB ranges have been defined earlier in the day. We're not sure if we're going to update our duration model. Um, then we're going to run a lot of point source simulations at probably four magnitudes and 10 or 11 distances um, and perform regressions. And then we'll be addressing variability and coefficient smoothing in the regressions. And then here are some references. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. One, two, making good time. Question for you. Can you guys do uh, our RUP instead of RJB for us? I think so. Walt? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You Stop. can read Walt's face better than I can. Okay. Uh, any questions for Bob here? It's the first time we really present their model. So there's Anne Marie and then Stuart and then Bohr and Prashesh. Thanks. Uh, Dan Marie Balte. Um, so I guess speaking for the seismological community, having a decreasing stress drop with increasing magnitude is very confusing, and I'm sure I've said this before. So from a sake of just fitting the data, I guess I would encourage you not to advertise that. Um, <laughs> it just increases the disconnect between the group here and seismologists. Um, when seismologists see that, they just throw up their hands and walk away. Well, we'll call it stress parameter then. Even, even so, why not just use the saturation model, which is much more physical? Well, we keep, we, one, there's not enough real data to discern these two in the east, and they give different predictions with increasing distance. So we like to give the modelers a choice of GMPEs, and if you don't like one model, just give it zero weight. All right, well, then I'll, I'll voice my concern that it doesn't seem like that one's very physical. Okay. Well, well, as we know, the, the point source model has already been described as a kindergarten model, not very sim simple. And since my background is in seismology, I can say this. It's a, it's a KISS model. Keep it simple, seismologist, is how I, how I, how I taught myself what it means. Um, but it, it, I agree, it's very simple, and there are some non-physical uh, portions of it but it does very well at fitting um, strong motion data over a wide range of magnitudes, distances, and site conditions. And maybe we're just lucky, or, um, you know, that's how it is. No, I'm not disagreeing. I think the stochastic method is great. It just seems like you can use other more physical descriptors to get at this saturation. Yeah, that's and all. we use both of them. So we're keeping our options open. So we have John Stewart and Dave Bohr. And then Sharam. Um, so I, my question drew from your last, I think it was your last slide when you were talking about your future work. Almost there. That one, yes, thank you. So um, the parameters you're back calculating from NGA West 2, so the magnitude dependent depth term and the magnitude-dependent stress drop term with all the issues that go with that. Right, and the magnitude-dependent geometric attenuation can all, we'll try and get them from NGOS too. Okay, and then, and those get directly translated over to the east, is that right? And then other parameters are adjusted for west to east like kappa? And kappa will come from the inversions on the NGA east data directly. Okay. So is it correct that the stress drops in the west are going to be assumed to be the same as those in the east? No, we, we scale up the stress drops. We use the, we use, in 
uh, 2002 model, we assumed, say, roughly 100 bars for magnitude 4.5 and 5, it was actually 160 bars, and then we scaled it down for the saturation based on the trends we saw in the west. So we don't use these stress parameters in the east. They're, they're much higher. So, so we, we use this for the trends in stress parameter that we use in the east, but not for the absolute value of the stress I drop see. or stress parameter. For the parameter. scaling. So you're yeah. only using the western inversion to get the trend with magnitude, but then you shift that up yeah. when you move to the east. Yeah. And the geometric spreading is the same? Yes, we assumed, well, our model in geometric spreading is quite a bit different than other people's models, and that is driven by Western data, correct. But that is translated directly over. No. Yeah. Okay. So Gail is Canadian. She it can cut in. Oh, do, you, do you mind? It's a direct follow-up on that. Do you want me to go first, or do you want me to come back to it? Okay. It's a direct follow-up on, on John's thing. So just, and it, it's by way of comment. Um, so what Emra and I did in our, you know, the, just the, the previous paper, so we've done that calibration to the NGA West database. And so um, the, we do not find that we need a magnitude dependence to either the geometric spreading model, um, nor do we need a decreasing stress drop with magnitude um, for the NGA West 2 data. So, and, and uh, again, on John's point, then both the geometric spreading model and the functional form of the uh, magnitude scaling of the stress, which is basically that the stress drop increases until you get to a, about a magnitude 4 to 5, and then it's constant after that. We take that functional form and we transfer it directly to the east. So like you, we would have an offset in the stress. But we don't find that we need a decrease in stress with magnitude, uh, nor do we find we need a magnitude dependence in the geometric spreading for the inversion of the NGA West 2 database. And we'll probably find similar results once we invert that database. Uh, okay, my comment had to do with the question mark after the duration model. And uh, I, I very strongly recommend that you do consider a new duration model. The 0.05R that actually I had to do a little research to find out where that came from, because I've used it for years in my program, <clears throat> came from uh, simulations from Herman, and it really wasn't based on data. And when we looked at the Western data anyway, uh, we find like at 100 kilometers about a 10 second duration, whereas the 0.05R gives you a five second duration. In the East it's even longer. So. Please reconsider the duration. Okay. Then we had Sharam. Well, you answered my question. Gail answered my question. Uh, you, uh, page 18, you had uh, one more. Yeah. Your stress drop for lower magnitude was higher than, than hers is opposite of yours for lower magnitude. So yours uh, for like for magnitude 3 is 15 and 4 is 39. This is opposite of what you have. Uh, so it's, it's, it's confusing to me how these two models are completely opposite for lower magnitudes and for upper magnitudes as yeah. well. It's not actually opposite because he doesn't have magnitudes 3 or 4 on there. But the trend is going that way. Uh, yeah, it, it's the, the, the mountain. so our, you know, and I've consistently, ever since looking at this from like 1993 onwards, consistently find that you see um, that stress parameter increasing with the small magnitude events up till you get to some threshold, um, somewhere between four and five, and then at larger magnitudes um, finding a common stress. Now, what he's showing here is just the larger magnitudes, and he's uh, indicating a decreasing stress. And I believe that that decreasing stress is um, the, the reason he's getting that is, is because of the interplay of that with the saturation model. If he did it, used a different saturation model, as Anne-Marie pointed out, um, there wouldn't be a need to have a stress drop decrease. So 
and, and you know, Bob has just replied that, well, they're looking at all possibilities. So. Okay, another question? Isn't this table from NGA1? Yes. So we know that NGA1 over predicts the fives anyway. Right. But we didn't know that in 2002. No. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Bob, very much. Uh, our next presenter is going to be remotely, so that's the time to unmute the lines and wave if you heard me. Yes, perfect, okay. So I'm just going to remove the desktop sharing, and uh, the presentation is going to be by uh, Bazad Asani, and it's the Asani and Atkinson model. I need to unmute him. Okay, Bazad, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, but I cannot share my, my screen. So Let me make sure. Oh, I'm still sharing. Sorry. There you go. Go ahead. Uh, I still cannot share my screen. Just give it a second. Okay. Okay, now try. <laughs> uh, not yet. So uh, earlier on, I saw you were logged in in multiple places. You were presenting. You want, right? Yeah. Do you want me to log out or log in again? No. Do you see the? But you see the conference control. Yeah, but the share button is not uh, active. Okay, we'll demote you and re-promote you. Two promotions oh. in one day. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to promote you again. Okay. Okay, you're promoted now. Can you share now? No, still no. I cannot share my screen. Oh, that is, you know, it's amazing how these things work. It worked perfectly yesterday. So here's what we'll do. I'll move the slides for you, okay? Okay, that's fine. And I'll, I'll share my screen, and you should be able to see them. So let me go back and do a screen sharing. So do you see your slides, Bazad? Yep. Okay, cool. So just tell me when, and we'll <coughs> switch. Thank okay. you. Thanks. So hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Besat. I'm calling by phone. I hope that you can hear me clearly. So I'm a PhD student at Western University, and uh, I'm working under supervision of Dr. Gail Atkinson. So the presentation that I have today uh, is about reference empirical ground motion model for Eastern North America. Uh, first, I will give a short introduction about different approaches that we can use in Eastern North America, which have been used here. Uh, then I will discuss the model that uh, we have been used and the result and finally the conclusion. So can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so uh, at data-rich regions such as Western North America, it is uh, common to develop empirical ground motion equations uh, in a way that we have observed data and we try to develop a functional form to describe that observed ground motion uh, as a function of key parameters such as magnitude, distance, and uh, station uh, or site uh, side effect. Uh, but uh, at poor data regions such as Eastern North America, uh, it is not usually possible to achieve a robust model uh, using empirical regression. So here we have uh, a couple of uh, alternatives to develop ground motion prediction equations. So uh, the first and the most common alternative is simulation-based method. So here, basically, we assume a seismological-based model. And we try to calibrate that model using the sparse observed data uh, in Eastern North America or any other region which have a poor observed database. And then we try to expand our model to other distance and magnitude ranges. Uh, another approach that is common here uh, in poor data region is hybrid empirical method introduced by CAMPO in 2003. Uh, so basically, in this model, we have some 
empirical ground motion function in a data rich region, uh, what we call here a host region. And we try to somehow modify those equations to be applicable uh, in the target region or the poor data region. Uh, so these uh, adjustment factors that we use to convert uh, equations in the host region to the target region obtained using the ratio of seismological model that we have in the target and the host region. So we use similar uh, seismological model and uh, we try to find the adjustment factors. And then there is another method uh, introduced by Atkinson in 2008. Uh, it is reference empirical method. It is similar in concept to hybrid empirical method, uh, although here we try to find the adjustment factors using the observed empirical uh, ground motion data that we have in the target region divided by the equivalent uh, predicted values using the host GMPs. So in both of these methods, we assume that the magnitude scaling uh, is similar uh, between the host GMP and the prediction GMP that we are going to have for the target region. And also the distance scaling uh, is going to be, uh, close distance scaling is going to be similar between these two regions. Uh, so as I said, uh, reference empirical method proposed by Atkinson in 2008. Uh, at the time, they used NGI West uh, first generation model. Uh, so they updated their model in 2011 using an updated version of NGI West model, which was more robust for small to magnitude events. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, what we are going to do here, uh, we are going to update uh, Eastern North America reference empirical model using the newly published NJ West 2 GMP model. So as you may know, NJ West 2 model uh, has better data set at a small to moderate magnitude range, and it is more robust when we want to compare those uh, GMP equations with the observed data in Eastern North America, which is usually uh, located between a small to moderate magnitude range and at regional distances. Uh, so uh, here we used a uh, reference equation of Bohr, Stewart, Sihan, and Atkinson 2014, denoted as BSSA 14. Uh, I should mention that uh, we could use any of the uh, ground motion prediction equation of NJ West 2 model. Basically, we have five equations. Uh, but uh, we chose to use BSSA 14 because it is especially convenient uh, to use for Eastern North America. Uh, the parameters uh, that we need to use for the prediction model is already available uh, in Eastern North America. And it is more robust for a small magnitude range and for large distances up to uh, smaller than 400 kilometers. And next slide, please. So uh, this is the map of the database that uh, we used in this study. This is Eastern North America database. Uh, as you can see, we have two regions. We have East, uh, which consists of South, uh, Eastern Canada, and North Eastern United States. And we have a Central, uh, which is corresponding to Central United States. Uh, you can see the station and magnitudes color coded. Uh, so this database is obtained uh, from NJE database, the updated version Seismo Toolbox website for most of the records that we have uh, in Canadian stations. And we also have some data from South Ontario database. Uh, it's a database that we are uh, developing uh, currently. Uh, so for this database, we decided to remove the Gulf Coast station and Gulf Coast event uh, that we had in that area. Uh, because of the different attenuation trend, uh, which was previously reported by uh, different researchers. So this is the whole uh, database that we are going to use. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the magnitude distance distribution of the database uh, in the central and east region. And in the bottom, we can uh, see the histogram of number of stations at each site classes. Uh, as you can see here in the magnitude uh, distance graph, most of the data are located between magnitude 3 up to magnitude 5. And we have few events larger than magnitude 5. And also at close distances, uh, we just have a sparse database. We do not have enough data at close distances smaller than uh, maybe 30 or 40 kilometers. 
And uh, as a matter of site classification in central region, most of the data are recorded on site class C and D. And in the east uh, region, most of the data are recorded in site class E and D. Also, we have lots of uh, site class C stations. Next slide, please. So the reference empirical method uh, basically needs two inputs. The first input is the observed ground motion uh, in the target region, or in this case, it's in North America. Uh, the ground motion parameters that we use are the ground acceleration, the ground velocity, and 5% damp so the spectral acceleration uh, at frequencies between 0 0.1 up to 20 hertz. And the input parameter are equivalent values obtained from a reference equation. So BSSA 14 model is used here. Uh, we define the uh, faulting mechanism as unspecified here. So basically, we use the same magnitude, distance, and uh, shear wave velocity of these stations that we had uh, in it's a North America database to obtain the equivalent values. And then, uh, okay, so these equations kind of mixed up here, but that's okay. Then we define the residual as the ratio of uh, observation values in Eastern North America uh, divided by uh, prediction values using the ground motion prediction equation uh, of the host region. And in this, in this figure in the right hand side, you can see the residuals plotted for one hertz as a function of distance. So we are trying to define a functional form uh, to best fit these uh, observed residual trend. So this uh, functional form uh, needs to uh, level any overall differences, overall source differences between these two regions, any elastic attenuation differences, and any difference in attenuation shape that uh, we might expect between these two regions. Next slide, please. Okay, so there's a problem with this equation. Uh, but uh, basically, in the left hand side, uh, we have a residual obtained at each station, uh, at each event, and we define a C1 term. This C1 term is going to adjust the overall level of the BSSA-14 model. Uh, we have C2 term, which is multiplied by distance, and is going to adjust any regional differences in elastic attenuation. And we have C3 term, uh, which is multiplying by that, fun by that function. And basically, this C3 term is going uh, to produce a trilinear attenuation model uh, and somehow change the attenuation model that we have uh, in BSSA 14 to match the observed data in Eastern North America. And also, we have a random event term, eta, and we have a within event residual term uh, also showed at epsilon. Uh, so here we used a mixed effect regression of residuals according to Abrahamson and Young uh, in 1992, and we uh, iteratively solved this equation uh, to find C1, C2, and C3, and also variability parameters. And then uh, by multiplying this residual trend uh, to the predicted ground motion from uh, BSSA 14, we can observe the prediction model for Eastern North America. So this is the whole idea uh, of the reference empirical model. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Can you hear me? Hello? Hi, Bazad. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Would okay, you sorry. Last, uh, uh, did, did you miss anything about this slide? Or? Yes, we did, but I, was, I wanted to ask you if it's worth it for, uh, for us to put a PDF of your slideshow, if you have more equations. Uh, no, no, I don't have any more equations. So. That's it? Okay, then. Yeah. So do you want the me to repeat the slide? Yeah, it's just a subscript. They're just, uh, they're just, okay, that's all there is, right? Okay. Okay. Then okay. Let's carry on. Uh, Thank you. Should I continue from this slide or just repeat this slide? Okay. Please. Uh, okay. Uh, so as I said, uh, uh, we are finding a 
procedural trend based on the observed ground motion divided by predicted ground motion in the Oz region. And here is the result that we obtained for the central and east region. Uh, so here we are showing the residual as a function of distance at different frequencies for 1 hertz and 5 hertz. So uh, basically, as we can see here, for both of the frequencies, at close distances, at distances that are smaller than 50 kilometers, uh, the residual is almost uh, equal to zero. It means that the observed data in eastern North America is similar to the, the equivalent predicted values in BSSA. Uh, but by increasing distance from 50 kilometers, uh, we can see an increasing trend of the residuals. So the residuals uh, are increasing when we increase the distance, and this is a function of uh, frequency, different at 1 hertz and 5 hertz. Uh, next, please. Uh, so another thing that we observe here, oh, sorry, previous slide. Would you please go to the previous slide? OK, thanks. So another thing that we observe here is the similarity between the central and east region. The residual trend that we observe here uh, is almost similar between central and east region. And from this point, because to obtain a more robust result, uh, we will combine the central and east region together. Next slide, please. So here uh, we are showing the residual for the whole Eastern North America database, combine those uh, East and Central database together at four different frequencies, uh, from 0 0.5 up to 10 hertz as a function of distance. Uh, so again, we can see at close distances, distances smaller than 50 kilometers, at least up to 5 hertz, we do not observe any difference uh, between the observed ground motion in eastern North America and the predicted one in uh, western North America. But when we go to higher frequencies, then we go to frequencies uh, like 10 hertz, uh, we observe the difference. Uh, we have positive residuals even at close distances. And again, at larger distances, distances larger than 50 kilometers, we have a positive residual trend increasing by distance and increasing by frequency. Uh, this residual trend can be described by the different or higher attenuation uh, or uh, higher stress drop that we uh, expect to observe in eastern North America and slower attenuation rate uh, that again we expect to observe in eastern North America compar uh, comparing to uh, western North America. Uh, so another thing that I want to mention here in this figure, uh, there is a solid line that plotted uh, in this figure. It's showing the simulation ratio. Uh, so this simulation ratio uh, obtained by Atkinson et al. 2014 paper, uh, they presented a set of uh, simulation parameters for Eastern North America and Western North America. And here we just try to obtain the ratio based on the simulation model in Eastern North America divided by simulation model in Western North America. So uh, this is somehow similar in concept to the hybrid empirical uh, approach of Campbell. Uh, as we can see here, uh, the ratio that we obtain from the simulation uh, models and the ratio that we obtain from the empirical data almost match together in all frequencies. So it means that if you use the same uh, simulation-based models and if you use the same uh, empirical models uh, probably are going to have the same uh, prediction model for Eastern North America using these two models. Uh, next slide, please. Next. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, from equation one, uh, as I said, we solved the equation for uh, within even term and between even term. So here we plotted the within even term at different frequencies as a function of distance. Uh, basically, uh, we cannot observe any significant trend as a function of distance in within even term. And the overall behavior of the residuals uh, uh, is satisfactory in all frequencies. Next slide, please. And here again, uh, we show the within event residual term, or epsilon, as a function of shear wave velocity uh, to see if we have any trend uh, with shear wave velocity of the stations that we had here. 
So basically, we use PSSA 14 model to uh, correct our ground motion data for site amplification, and we wanted to see that uh, how does uh, how did that work? Uh, if we have any residual or not. So the overall level that we observe here at different site classes, so we average them at different site classes, the overall level is satisfactory, so we don't have any significant residual. Uh, the only residual that we may have is at site class E at uh, low frequencies. So it might be that uh, the site amplification function that we use from the SSA 14 uh, is not probable for site class E because of the deep sediments that we have uh, in central region. Uh, so that's the only issue that we have here. Next slide, please. And uh, this is the between even term or eta that we obtain again from equation one plotted uh, again at the same four frequencies uh, as a function of magnitude. And again, the overall behavior of this between even term uh, is good. We don't have any significant uh, residual trend at different magnitude beam. Uh, so we assume that the magnitude is scaling uh, that we use from the SSA 14 uh, at least work here uh, for the magnitude range of the data that we have in Eastern North America. Next slide, please. So. Uh, this is the ground motion prediction equation comparison of a magnitude 4 with uh, shear wave velocity of a station of site equal to uh, 760 meter per second. So the solid line shows our model, HA14, and uh, we compare it with the actual observed data in this region for magnitude 3.75 up to 4.25. And as we expect from the definition of this method, uh, they should match the observed ground motion here in this region. So that's the case that we can observe here at different frequencies. And uh, when we compare HA14 with BSSA14, we can see that at close distances up to 50 kilometers uh, and uh, at frequencies smaller than 5 hertz, they almost match together. So there's no difference between the predicted model in Eastern North America and Western North America, at least up to 50 kilometers for frequencies lower than 5 hertz. Uh, but uh, they start to deviate from each other after 50 kilometers and uh, higher frequencies as a reason of uh, higher standard deviation in Eastern North America and slower attenuation rate. Uh, we also plotted the result of AB06 prime, which is the simulation-based model of Atkinson and Bohr 2006, the modified version, and the result of uh, Atkinson 2008 uh, reference empirical uh, model. So uh, to, uh, to compare with AB06 prime, uh, we can see that the shape of the uh, attenuation model is almost the same with AB06 prime, also we have uh, different attenuation at lower frequencies and almost similar attenuation at frequencies uh, higher than 5 hertz. And uh, the comparison with uh, H08 prime uh, shows that again at regional distances they match together, but at smaller distances there is a significant difference for magnitude 4 event. That might be because of the reference uh, GMP that's used in H08 prime uh, was NJ West. Uh, first generation model, and uh, those equations uh, were not originally developed for small magnitude events. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this is the same comparison that we made for magnitude 5. Again, we compared those equations together uh, and with actual observed data that we had in this region. So the comparison between HA14 and BSSA14 is not magnitude dependent, so we can see the same trend here. And uh, again, with uh, the comparison of HA14 and AB06 prime and A08, A08 prime, shows the similar result that we observed for magnitude 4. Next slide, please. So. This is the comparison of GMPs for large magnitude for magnitude uh, equal to 7 uh, at 760 meter per second for VS30. Uh, again, the comparison of HA14 and VSSA14 is not magnitude dependent, 
but when we compare SA14 with AB06 prime, uh, they are almost similar at frequencies lower than 1 hertz, but at higher frequencies, frequencies uh, of 5 hertz and 10 hertz, we can see that at close distances, uh, AB06 prime predicts uh, higher ground motion amplitudes comparing to SA14. So this might be because of the saturation term that uh, considered in the reference model. So the saturation term is uh, uh, higher in the reference uh, DSSA 14 model comparing to AB06 prime. And uh, comparing to A08 prime, HA14 to A08 prime, uh, we observe different uh, close distance behaviors, at, especially at low frequencies. And that's mainly because that these two models use two different reference models, the first generation of NGA uh, West model and the second generation model. Next slide, please. And this is the response the spectra comparison for the same shear wave velocity for two magnitudes and two distances. The first one uh, is magnitude 5 at distance 10 kilometers and 100 kilometers, and the same for magnitude 7. So uh, at 10 kilometers for magnitude 5 and magnitude 7, all of the models almost uh, represent the same uh, level of uh, response spectrum, at least up to 5 hertz. Uh, but DSSA 14 starts to deviate after 5 hertz uh, from the other models, and the other models, again, almost represent the same uh, amount of uh, so the spectral acceleration level. And at regional distances, again, because of the different attenuation behavior, uh, BSSA 14 model uh, is uh, different at all frequencies uh, from the HA14 model. Uh, also, there is some differences between HA14, AB06 prime, and A08 prime. Uh, that's because of the different assumption that they have about magnitude scaling at close distance behaviors. Uh, so. Next slide, please. So up to now, we only use BSSA 14 model. And uh, one might uh, want to use another GMP model as the reference model. So here we are going to discuss what's going to happen if we use another GMP model as a reference model. Are we going to get different results? Uh, all right. Uh, so here we try to use Campbell and Bozorknia 2014 NGA West2 model as a reference model. So we again uh, apply the same exercise to obtain the residual trends and residual uh, function. And as you can see here, the yellow line is uh, for Campbell and Bozorknia 2014, and the dashed line is for PSSA 14 model. Uh, they almost match together at all frequencies and at all distances. So we expect to see this uh, behavior because all of them uh, use the same NGA Quest 2 database, uh, which is a very rich database at small to moderate magnitude range. Uh, so we expect to observe this similarity between different NGA Quest 2 models. It means that uh, we will obtain the same uh, residual trends if we use different NGAVS2 model. We just need to apply those equations to the reference model uh, to develop a reference empirical, reference empirical GMP for Eastern North America. Next slide, please. And here is just a comparison uh, for magnitude 5 and magnitude 7 uh, events uh, at the same site condition. Uh, for the model that we obtained based on BSSA 14 GMP as the reference model and Campo and Bozorknia 14 as the reference model. So the difference uh, is not significant for magnitude 5 and magnitude 7, uh, although there is some differences at close distances, which might be because of the different near source uh, scaling function uh, that they use in their models. Next slide, please. Uh, so in summary, the model applicability uh, and the limitation that we have for the uh, presented model, uh, anything or any limitation that we have in PSSA 14 model is going to be to transfer to HA 14 model. 
So the distance limitation in the SSA 14 model is uh, joiner and bore distance between 0 to 400 kilometers, and the distance metric is joiner and bore. Uh, the magnitude is between 3 to 8.5, and the model uh, developed originally for VS30 equal to 760 meter per second, but we can use the side correction factors of PSSC 14 to develop model for uh, 150 and 1500 meter per second. Uh, for this range between 150 up to 1500 meter per second. Uh, so again, the magnitude of scaling is the same as BSSA 14, as it is the closest in the scaling, and there is no source depth dependency considered. Next slide, please. Uh, so to conclusion, uh, we update the former reference empirical model which was A08 prime, we believe that this is a significant improvement considering the development of, uh, considering the uh, NGA West 2 project and uh, its benefit over NGA West 1 project. And uh, we observe similar, similar residual trends comparing East and Central regions. So the empirical adjustment factor that we obtained uh, are similar to the simulation based adjustment factors. At close distances, residual trends tend to be insignificant, uh, except at very high frequencies, frequencies higher than 5 hertz. So as distance increase, the residual gradually increase. This is because of the slower, slower attenuation rate uh, that we expect to observe in Eastern North America database. So we, have, uh, we obtain a similar attenuation shape as H06 prime, which is a trilinear model. Uh, also, here we have great saturation effect compared to H06 prime. And uh, we obtain similar adjustment factors uh, using other NGUS to GMP. So we can use these factors uh, to produce similar uh, reference empirical model for Eastern North America. Uh, so thank you. So, questions? Um, if I understood what you, you said, at short distances, and let's say magnitude fives or something, the ground motion is the same between the east and the west, below five hertz. Is that right? Yes. Yep. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling a bit yeah. with that. I had, I, I thought one of our basic, un I thought stress drops were systematically higher in the east than they were in the west, and is that? <coughs> yeah, but uh, the stress drop uh, is going to mostly affect higher frequencies. So at lower frequencies, up to high, five hertz, the stress drop is not that important. Right. Yep. It's exactly as Bazad said. And I, you know, to me, that's one of the most interesting things and the important things about making just a simple plot like that. This is how did the eastern motions in the NGA East database? We just plotted them exactly as they came out of the database. We corrected for VS30 exactly as we would for the West, um, and just plot the residual trends. And the bottom line is that uh, if you're at five hertz and below, there's not a whole lot of evidence for uh, systematic differences between the, um, the east and the west if you're in close. And that is because at those magnitudes that uh, the, the stress drop, it, it just comes in at the higher frequencies. Right? By the time you move up to larger magnitudes, that stress drop effect then um, will show up at a lower frequency. Can you attribute all of the, or the difference in the high frequency part to stress drop and not to kappa <laughs> above five hertz? Because could you explain it both ways? You don't have the big magnitude data to tell you what's going on. You can uh, so so I, you know, I look at kappa as being a site term. So um, I would put everything <coughs> in the high frequency in stress drop. Right, and kappa I would use for the site condition. 
So if your reference condition is BC, I would say that's going to have a cap of about 0 0.02, 0 0.03. Right? If you're if you were looking at hard rock, you'd have a lower cap up. So I would distinguish a stress drop being a source term and kappa being a site term. Dave? And in addition to that, <coughs> we are assuming that the side effect factors from the west work in the east up to 1,500 meters per second. Uh, yeah, that's the assumption. Yes, that's right. Yep, yep. So we just make the initial assumption that they will work, and then we look at what's left. Okay, any other questions? Is anybody else struggling with this? Yes. I'm trying to... Um, Which one? Well, I was doing... For a harder rock site, we would say there's a lower cap in the east and the yeah. west, right? This? So. For those sites, part of the high frequency difference should be kappa and not stress drop. Repeat and, the question. Uh, mm -hmm. So where are the, does this difference still work for comparing hard rock sites in the west and the east? And Gail said, show me a hard rock site in the west. And Bob said Anza, so which is maybe a thousand meters per second. It's not really hard. But when you do your site adjustments, you, you assume they apply directly without considering the cap I say. That's what I'm, that's the missing part for me. That's what she, but she would, I assume you would see on the, high, once you adjust it for stress drop on the average source term, you would still see something else at your harder rock site that wouldn't be working. Because our VS30 scaling doesn't pick up kappa, right? Uh, but I think the model, the uh, site model that proposed by ESSA 14 is somehow scale the kappa or consider the kappa effect for site amplification. Uh, maybe it's not the same for east and west. I'm not sure about that. Uh, but we didn't observe any residual, any uh, uh, between event residuals. Because if you're if you're doing a GMPE like for the west. If, you, if you're applying your GMPE to your site, the site variable is VS30, mm -hmm. right? So you're not putting, there is no kappa in any of the NGA West 2 equations. It's not a descriptive variable. So I, I want to go back to this, well, I guess Lauren's original question. Um, and the plot that's up here, I guess it's about like what, 40, 50 kilometers and less, it's pretty, pretty much flat. Now the, the highest frequency um, is five hertz. If, so Gail, yeah, what you're saying the next is slide, please. Uh, repeat the that. Can you go to the next slide, please? For the whole, uh, yeah, this one. the next one. Okay, so oh, 10 hertz. Okay. okay, so Gail, this is what you were referring to, is that as you get up to, uh, and that's what I was wondering. Yeah. So if you, and presumably, I don't know how far you can push this with, um, or can you even go to higher frequency? I guess you could, right? If uh, you went up to yeah. 20 hertz. Yeah, we de develop the model up to 20 hertz. Yeah, and so. Gail, what you're saying is, yeah, it would, it would continue to go up. Uh, it's not continue to go up. If you go to the one of the last slides about response to spectral comparison. Sorry. Yeah. Can you go? Ah, I don't know, the last. Sorry. One of the last slides. Oh, before that, before. before. I went too fast. Before. Do you know the slide number? <laughs> uh, it's just before this one, before slide number 16, 15. Okay. So, for example, if we look at uh, 
for example, the results that we have for a magnitude 5 at distance equal to 10 kilometers. Uh, here, uh, this difference that we observe at frequencies higher than 5 hertz, because before that, they all, all of them represent the same shape. So this difference is uh, somehow increasing by increasing the frequencies at least up to 20 hertz. Uh, but uh, yeah, we just uh, developed the model up to 20 hertz. But uh, I think we can put a cap in this 20 hertz uh, for this increase. Okay, so actually, I, in looking at this plot, I yeah. I now think I follow what Norm was asking about kappa. Gail, you were saying that that doesn't explicitly appear in the equation, uh, yeah. but it is in the data. And so yeah. that, say that rollover of BSSA 14, mm -hmm. maybe is just representing kappa, or it could be the stress parameter uh, effect as well. I, yeah, so I, I, when I look at this plot, I'm, uh, I, I can't uh, distinguish. So if, yeah, if there is a difference between kappa in eastern North America and western North America for different sites, shear wave velocity, uh, that might be modeled in this figure. But we assume that there is no difference or we don't have any evidence to assume such a thing. Okay, Art? Yeah, I mean, don't we see from intensity data that eastern U.S. earthquakes magnitude 5 have higher intensities than western U.S. ones? Uh, are you saying intensity is more like 10 hertz rather than 5 hertz? Yeah, so my interpretation is that the reason we see higher intensities for moderate earthquakes in the east is because I think that um, intensity is a broad spectrum from probably anywhere from frequencies from 1 to 10 hertz. And what um, I would infer is that the reason the intensities are higher in the east is because the 5 to 10 hertz band is higher. And so the intensity is showing you the average effect. So you will see higher intensities because the 5 to 10 hertz band is higher. I have a problem with yeah. that. I mean, we see intensities related to site conditions. And under very strong ground shaking, you would expect the site amplification to decrease. In other words, if it was really 10 hertz, then uh, a soft soil site would probably, that's undergoing high accelerations or input high accelerations, is, you're gonna, that's going to disappear, that difference between site conditions given the nonlinearity of the, the soft soil side. The intensity observations we have for the east are by and large not nonlinear. We're looking at magnitude 3 to 4 earthquakes at 10 to 20 kilometers. I don't think we're seeing a lot of nonlinear site response. Well, I don't think there's a, at larger distances, there's probably very little 10 hertz energy anyways. Uh, so I'm, I have a problem. What's the corner frequency for magnitude 5? I would think it's a couple of hertz or something like that. Yeah, somewhere one hertz. hertz. So I would have expected to see differences at 5 hertz because of the stress drop. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't have that here. No. Uh, it's hard to say with PSA what the heck yeah. frequency there is. But are again, there. you know, it's just, it's simply a plot of what the residuals are with respect to BSSA 14 or Campbell and Bezorka 14. That's just what the residuals are. Well, it doesn't really you have, have to anything to do. I mean, we don't that. adjust for stress drop. We don't adjust for kappa. All we do is we say if we were in the West, and you know, just if you were predicting using BSSI A14 or CB14, what the ground motions would be, how far off would you be? And the answer is not very far if you're in close and your frequencies are less than 5 hertz. You, you might not like it, but that's... <laughs> I think this is what you see. So, all right. So now it's what is... What, what do you, you do with it? <laughs> Well, I also think a lot of it is how you adjust for the site conditions, right? And 
there's some controversy about that. John, do you still want to comment? Yeah. John Stewart? And so this plot that we're looking at is total residuals, which you correct? Just yes. Let's verify that first. This is total residuals. Yes. Yeah. Which you had to do at this phase because obviously the distance attenuation is from DSSA is not right for the data. So I understand why yeah. you did that. Later on in your analysis, you got event terms. Uh. Um, would there be any value in taking those event terms and calculating within event residuals and seeing if uh, this misfit at close distance would still exist? Uh, uh, those plots are there. Yep. I thought those were for the model with everything corrected, with a new model, basically. No, it's uh, for the residual model. If you go to back to the equation, so are I thought these plots were for your Eastern North America model. No, it's for the residual model. Uh, just. Uh, if you go back to equation one, just previous slides, a few previous this slides. This beautiful equation. Yeah. This, this has, those plots have to be after he's done this correction. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. After this correction. Right. <coughs> yeah. So, but in terms of comparing the east with the west, I guess what I was just wondering is how much of that misfit at close distance could be just an artifact of some sort of an event term. There aren't that many events. Uh, maybe in that distance range, and uh, that could be misleading us. So, yeah, uh, it might be, but uh, we don't. Uh, we didn't observe any uh, dependency on the with any one term that uh, between any one term that when we compare it for different magnitudes. So. I might just also mention that it's not, this isn't the first time we've seen this. I'm thinking back to a paper that I did with a student, Mark Morrison, in 2009, where we looked at ground motions in California in the NGA West database, and, and one of the observations we made was that at that point, at that time, was that you could take an eastern ground motion prediction equation, like AB06, and that it actually matched the small magnitude data from California pretty well. That was saying the same thing in a different way. So I don't find this all that surprising. One other question is, is the way that you, um, you have broken out the Gulf Coast is oh. different than what we're doing? Because so you, the um, Mississippi embayment is in your data set, and it's not in ours. How much of the data are from that? There's a lot of event, there, There's a lot of stations and events right in the embayment. So it would be nice to yeah. pull those out and see if if that's what's um, contributing to the similarity. I'm not sure what it would be. Yeah, okay. there is the double panel that uh, he showed earlier um, that shows the difference between the central and the east which was not very large. So there was a slide oh. that showed that. That was why we combined them together. We started yeah, with them being separate. Slide eight. Yeah, so we started with those two different databases, the central and the east, and the dashed line was the difference, was where we drew the line between them. And then if you look, there's another slide that compares uh, that one, that one right there, right? So that shows the difference in trend um, you know, to the left and right of that center line, and, and the differences didn't look all that compelling, so we combined them together. So while this slide is up there, I actually had one other question, which is when you adjusted the distance attenuation model from DSSA uh, to remove this trend, what were the coefficients you changed? Was it geometric spreading and anelastic and magnitude dependence, mm -hmm. or did you fix some of them? No, we didn't actually change BSSA at all, right? What we did was we defined an, a function to add onto it, an adjustment function. So that black line is the adjustment function. So essentially you take the, pr the prediction from BSSA 14 and you add the black function, and that's the ground motion prediction oh, right. model. 
Uh, Chris Kramer, quick comment on <clears throat> segregating out the data from the northern Mississippi embayment. The attenuation relation by Zandia and Pizesh say that that's uh, about 600 Q naught. It looks like eastern North America, uh, say continental Q there. So that data, I'm not surprised. You know, the segregation shows a little difference, at least uh, as much as that data contributes to this. There shouldn't be any difference between the two. So can you repeat your question? Sorry, I couldn't hear it clearly. Can, can you well, repeat? It, it, it was more a statement. No, that comment. was a comment, not a, not a question. Oh, okay. Your light's not green. Uh, well. You need to slow down. It's flashing. Hello? Okay, we need a new mic. Uh, so we probably need new batteries. They're dying, by the way, so we'll use another one now. Can you switch yeah. back to their... Always want to make you happy. Where? So their data plot, this data distribution. Uh, this? Yes. No. Back to the sorry, the map. Most of the data is actually out of the embayment. So even though they have events in there, their paths are primarily outside of the embayment path. So I'm not sure that that would make a big difference in what they were doing. The large distances yeah. where they're seeing differences, they're all out in the in our central region. Yeah, and the, the distance, they saw differences in distances beyond the 100 or so, so yes, it's longer path. Sure. We were talking about within 50 kilometers, is there a re would they get agreement with BSSA at short mm -hmm. distances because they're in a Gulf it's Coast, tough, yeah. okay? But what Gail has said is the attenuation she sees on the right-hand side, which is zero Gulf Coast influence, right, is the same. So if there's no difference there, it's not yep. going to be explained by the inclusion of some of the Mississippi embayment, right? So yep. tail's That's not in yet. That's what I heard, too. All right. Gabe, uh, you stretching or you have a question? Okay. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, uh, Bazad. Uh, do you have one thank more you, comment guys. before we mute you? <laughs> okay. No, it's because the sound is not as good when people are unmuted. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, so okay, thanks. Uh, we have time to discuss a couple of things on uh, uh, the models we've seen so far. Uh, is there any remaining questions? This morning we didn't really have a lot of time for y um, EMRA. As model, is there anything that's remaining? Norm, in our list, do you have anything else that we didn't cover? I thought there was one thing in the slide in the well, list. Well, Norm is looking to see if there's anything covered. I'll just remember to, there's one last comment that I wanted to make okay. on that um, one in the, that uh, might not have been uh, obvious to everybody. So the line that Bizad showed for the simulation was essentially a hybrid empirical equivalent, right? So a simulation-based ratio. So if, if you take two sets of simulations, one for a western set of parameter and one for an eastern set of parameter, and you, you take the ratio, which is essentially what the hybrid, what the referenced empirical is doing, um, essentially we get the same line. So simulation-based ratios would also not predict a great difference between the, the east and the west. So the, the, the line there, the thin line, comes from taking the ratio of point source simulations for the west and the east. So we would say that the referenced empirical model there actually agrees with what you would predict from a hybrid empirical model. OK, on that note, we're going to declare uh, an early break. Is that good, Norm? You're Thinking there was one thing problem. that we had written down um, for, uh, I'm going to say Rangyangye, is that how it's pronounced? I, I'm, 
and uh, how do you say your name? Yes. yes. Y and A, I will call it. Sorry. Um, the fundamental difference in your approach is what, what I saw from these other ones, because I'm trying to figure out how these things differ, is you had a, a model based on Fourier amplitude spectrum and then a term in that model that converted the, the geometrical spreading to PSA. Is that really the, the, the key difference part of this? As it's uh, there are a couple of uh, new things we add uh, in this generic GMP. The first uh, new uh, addition is the stress parameter is not amplitude dependent. It is determined from the spectral shape. That's the first uh, difference compared to other models. Uh, the other one is we isolate all effects uh, through the regression uh, considering the uh, change in the geometrical spreading in Fourier domain uh, when you convert to the ground motions in response spectrum domain. So um, if I bring up that slide. Do you want me to bring that while you're yes, please. stuff? Okay, yes. Just a stop. Tell so. a story. <laughs> Okay, sorry. So just to take a step backwards from what Emra said, the first part of your question. So the difference between the two is the presentation you just saw was strictly a referenced empirical model. And the one that Emra presented is based on point source stochastic simulation. So Emra's model is a point source stochastic simulation based ground motion prediction model in which certain parameters of the stochastic simulation have been calibrated against the empirical data. So in EMRA's model, we care what the stress drop is. We care what kappa is. We care what all those other parameters are. And in Bazad's model, we don't care what any of those parameters are because we're just plotting residuals relative to a em empirical GMP. No, not because I'm lost a little bit again. Are you? Are you when you compare to the data, because it's again reference to data, right? Are you adjusting the parameters in the point source model? I thought you instead were adding on terms. That the point source model was, you had a reference point source model with 100 bars and, and parameters that are fixed. Yes. With an adjustment to move it to response vector, which is this term here. Yes. And then the rest was adding on other parameters to fit the data, or are you going back and changing the point source model? Code? No, we, we changed the point source model, actually. Like, um, okay. I'll, I'll come to that slide. So here. So uh, this is the uh, functional form for generic GMP, right? Uh, so if you want to adjust this generic GMP to uh, a specific region, you need to modify the source and attenuation parameters uh, included in this GMP. So what are these uh, parameters? Are the stress parameter, first of all, in okay. the uh, so, so source term. So can, but you had an equation, didn't you, for what FE looked like, for example? Yes, sure, I can go back. I, okay. Yeah, here, uh, the source, source effect has two components, the magnitude effect, which is derived from the simulations for a fixed stress drop of 100 bars, and the uh, F delta sigma, it is the stress adjustment needed when you need, when you have a different stress okay. parameter. So if I just repeat what Gail said, so instead of saying go back and change, run the simulation with 150 bars, you say we've already parameterized that change for you and here's what it is, right? Yes. But this equation is based on running the, the point simulation. source. Okay. Exactly. Okay. I think I, think I yeah. get it. So All this. Right. Uh, like both FM and F delta sigma functions are parameterized from the simulation. All right. Let me just follow up on that, so because I realize now it's confusing, right? So we did all the simulations so that you don't have to. That's the basic idea here: yeah. is that is that the way that the the parameters affect the simulations is entirely predictable. So if you've got one completely calibrated set of simulations 
uh, and in our case, we calibrated all the simulation parameters against the NGA West 2 database because that's well constrained. And then you say, well, okay, if you want to run it for NGA East, for example, or for some other database, or maybe some part of the NGA East database, rather than having to redo all the simulations all the time, we said you can predict the way that these are going to, the simulation parameters will change things. And so we've come up with what we think are simple functional forms, and some of them are recognizable, that hinged magnitude example, for example, we just borrowed straight out of the SSA 14, because we know from empirical data that's the way it goes. That's also the way simulations would tell you that it goes. So we just came up with um, simple functional forms that will make it easy to look at how changing the simulation parameters would change the ground motions without having to rerun thousands of simulations for every magnitude and every distance. It is a, it's a pl plug and play GMP. Yeah, when you enter the uh, region specific parameters, it adjusts itself to the so, specific region. Yeah. And, and so for example, with the stress parameter, you, you ran some range, right? I, I don't know what that might be, but. So the, the range is magnitude, there it is, magnitude 3 to 8, distances 1 to 400 kilometers, and the, uh, the stress drops we ran all the way from um, 10 That's bars right. to 1,000 bars. That's right. Okay. Back to the distance adjustment. If you run this range of distances, why do you need the distance adjustment? Which, which adjustment? This the one? distance adjustment that the one Norm asked about initially. Uh, is it the, uh, the are you talking about the, oh, okay. okay, let's see. Is it the calibration or? Uh, no, there's, well, calibration? Uh, yeah, go through the figures. Let me just uh, okay, bring yeah. up the, okay. Um, it should oh, be that. Uh, this one? That one, yes. Okay. Now, if, you, if you run starting at, a, at one kilometer, then, then why do you need this? Sorry? If you, if you run your source, point source model from one to 400 kilometers, mm -hmm. why is this term necessary? I do not understand, sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure I understood your question, but I'll, I'll try to answer it. So. This is one possible way that you could parameterize the geometric spreading term, right? And the reason we chose this one is because it allows you to decouple the geometric spreading rate that you see in papers that were done with the Fourier spectrum from what you should expect to see if you do simulations and you come up with the response spectra. So if you read a paper and it tells you, in my region, the geometric spreading is r to the minus 1.2, and you want to know what is my simulated response spectra going to look like, you don't have to do all the simulations. You've got the minus 1.2, which is the log z term there, and then the term on the right, that, that, that will not change. Actually, I, I have a sample. Uh if you, for example, completely change the Z function, for example, if you think that the geometrical spreading should be trilinear. So when you plug that trilinear model to the Z function and compare the genetic GMP with the trilinear model uh, to the simulations generated again with the trilinear model, they will overmatch. Right. So Actually, again, I can, uh, if you want, I have an example if you want to show me. Yeah, so again, the idea is you don't have to rerun the simulations because we've already run them and shown you the way the functional form works. And so all you, all you do is you change the Fourier spectrum part and the rest automatically adjusts itself to what you would get if you ran all those thousands of simulations. I need to follow my own rules. Let's take a break uh, 
and after the break, we'll show it. Do you have time to okay. take it, put in 15 minutes? Um, there should be coffee, I hope. There. Okay. 315. and drag and drop here, okay? Okay, whatever. You can browse, take a couple minutes to do that.
Yes, I'm not. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay. Sorry, we're going to start. We've passed uh, the break time. Norm needs to pay attention. Okay, people, we're starting again, please. Grab your coffee, finish your conversation, take your seat. John Ake, again, disrupting. Okay, so uh, before we go on to other proponent discussions and presentations, we're going to have uh, Emra uh, follow up on his promise that he had a couple slides. <laughs> it is only two slides. So uh, I want to just uh, show you how this generic GMP is flexible uh, and how this uh, decoupling of source and attenuation parameters works quite well. So if you remember, uh, we generated this generic GMP based on certain assumptions of geometrical spreading and stress parameter. So what if for the target region, we had completely different geometrical spreading, like a trilinear as shown here, a trilinear model, and a completely different, not completely, but slightly different saturation effect rather than uh, our saturation model, Atkinson Silva 2000 saturation model, and 300 parts of stress for, for all magnitudes. So actually, I will show you in the next slide uh, two things. The first thing is uh, you will see uh, the Jank GMP uh, predictions after entering, plugging these parameters. And the second thing, is the simulations performed based on these parameters. So this is how it looks like. So without requiring recalculation of all those parameters or without, being, without requiring simulations, as you can see, when you plug the correct or regional parameters like geometrical spreading and stress parameter, the Jank GMP adjusts itself automatically, uh, matching the simulations obtained from the same uh, parameters. So the uh, symbols are the simulations, and line is the Jank GMP when you plug the certain uh, source and attenuation parameters without repeating the regression. Our handhelds are not on. Can you? Oh, that one's okay. working. So, but the summary of this is that it, that term that you have to go from Fourier spectra to response spectra works over a wide range of point source parameters or geometrical spreading and Q and so forth. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah. that's what I took from it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the next presenter is going to be uh, Sharam Prajet, 
And uh, you, oh, we were not sharing the screen, so. So I apologize for people online who missed uh, this last slide. So Sharam PM. Oh, it's already here. No? Good. Yep. And yeah. Well, good afternoon. Uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about the ground motion prediction equations for Eastern North America uh, using the hybrid empirical method, another uh, hybrid method today. Uh, this is a, a true collaboration between several of us, uh, Zandia, uh, Campbell, and Talakoli. Zandia couldn't make it, but uh, Ken and uh, uh, Beirut are here, and uh, they would help me with answering some of the questions you might have. This work that we, I'm going to present is not our uh, final, so we consider it as our, our, our uh, preliminary results. So our purpose today is, as I present this, uh, we like to get feedback, that, uh, that we use the feedback to uh, improve our model as much as we could. Again, the hybrid empirical method, you have heard it several times. I, uh, I repeat it that you would le learn it real well. Uh, the hybrid empirical method was uh, developed by Campbell, and he has published uh, numerous papers from 1981 to 2011 regarding the empirical methods uh, in different uh, areas and regions. Uh, it's basically developed ground motion prediction equations for areas of, with sparse ground motion. Uh, in the, uh, basically, uh, again, you heard this so many times, we're developing ground motions uh, for the target region, for our case is Eastern North America, uh, from the, uh, using the predicted motion from the Western, uh, from the host region, which is the Western North America, North America uh, using empirical ground motion modification factor within these two regions. And these two radical modification factors are calculated as the ratio of stochastic simulations of ground motions for the two regions. And the, using region, regional seismological parameters and simulations, adjustment factors reflect the regional differences in source, site, and path. And in the hybrid method, the empirical drive uh, ground motion models for a host region are compared, are mapped onto the target region, considering the differences in the regional seismological uh, properties. Basically, if you want to find the ground motions uh, for Eastern uh, North America, you could use the ground motions for the Western North America, multiplying by uh, a adjustment factor or a uh, theoretical uh, ratios that we talked about, which is a function of uh, source, site, and path. And uh, in the past, uh, we had several uh, hybrid empirical methods that we are going to be improving it with this model. So the purpose of today uh, is to basically show the model that we have for 2011 for Pazish, Zandi, and Tavakuli, and Campbell 2007 and 11. And we want to update these uh, using the ground motion prediction equations for Eastern North America using, we use the five uh, new GMPEs for the NGA West that uh, was recently uh, published. And uh, furthermore, recent new information uh, on seismological parameters for eastern uh, United States that we're going to be using for our model. So our procedure is also uh, the point source stochastic simulation of ground motion amplitude for both western United States and eastern United States. To just build up on what I'm going to be talking about, if you're looking at the Western United States uh, and uh, looking at uh, the, the model that we did in 2011, we use these parameters for West and the parameters for Eastern United States. Uh, I want to get your attention to some of these parameters we used uh, uh, in 2011. We used stress drop 080. Uh, we used the uh, a bilinear model for West with the uh, slope of minus uh, one and the hinge point at 40 kilometers with the Q factor of 180 F to the uh, 0.45. We use this uh, path attenuation, uh, path duration, and uh, we use a cap of 0.04. Uh, in July, when we had the meeting here, uh, Ken was suggesting that we need to update our model for Western uh, uh, North America because 
these models are not uh, outdated. So one of the things we first started to do, we came up with inversion uh, of parameters for Western uh, North America. So we worked on the response spectra for Western North America earthquakes for magnitude less than six, so it can be uh, well described by a simple point source model. So we limited our uh, uh, inversion to a magnitude six. We're finding that the best fit for seismological parameter by matching stochastic simulation to the mean ground motion prediction equations of the NGA West 2 for a range of magnitudes and distances uh, up to magnitude 6. And we performed uh, inversion process. This inversion was similar to the uh, work that Sherbaum done in the past, and uh, we use the uh, optimization genetic algorithm approach to do this. For the uh, ground motion prediction equations for West, we used all these five models that uh, uh, you're all familiar with it. Uh, so, uh, and just to give you a typical uh, response spectrum for these five models, I plotted the uh, five for uh, magnitude seven, a distance of 30 kilometers. They look pretty close, uh, except uh, one is a little different. So we use the <coughs> geometric mean of these that would represent basically the, uh, the ground motion for the west. And the geometric mean that we used here was uh, uh, using uh, twice factor for all the ground motions except Idris, the same way that uh, USGS does. So we used uh, twice half as uh, uh, weight for Idris approach. And Idris also had some uh, uh, magnitude limitations that we, for some magnitudes that I think was five that we did not uh, consider below that Idris model. We use the generic uh, uh, attenuation models for, for example, I'm showing you one of them that we use the DSSA 14. Uh, it's based on the 760 uh, meter per second uh, VS30. We used only region zero, which was uh, California. And uh, some of these parameters like the basin, uh, depth of Z1 and uh, Z2.5, we use the 999, which is basically the default model. And the BSSA was the only model that was based on the RJB, and we converted to the R rupture using the Sherbaum uh, et al. 2004 distance, uh, which makes uh, up to 200 kilometers, and that uh, would be the same. We used the, again, this is the process that we did for the uh, Western United States for our inversion. To mimic the finite fault effect in the point source simulation, uh, in the effective distance, uh, we, we used the Atkinson Silo 2000 and Unir and Atkinson 2014. And this is the model we use basically to mimic the finite fault. And I realized today that uh, this has changed, that Gale has changed on us. Uh, and I see, I show you some of the models, I think why she did it, uh, because uh, we get some uh, oversaturation. I think that's the reason uh, is. So, but this is the model we knew about. It was the most recent, and we used it in our. And I have you saw this figure uh, earlier. Yermer had shown you that uh, if you're looking at the uh, uh, geometric spreading. If you have no saturation effect, basically, uh, it's bad. And if you have a magnitude four and seven, you could see the effect of uh, uh, effective distance. For the uh, the other part that we didn't put it in our, uh, it, we used as a sixth parameter in our inversion was the path duration. We adopted Bohr and Thompson 2014 path duration. We followed uh, Unir and Atkinson 2014 to convert uh, the model uh, rupture distance using the effective distance, and these are the, the values we got. And again, uh, pay attention a little bit to these uh, breaking points of 44 and 125. Uh, for, the, for our inversion for Western North America, we use the Bruin single corner frequency model. The stress parameter controls the spectral shape at high frequency along with the kappa value. Uh, uh, Gale used uh, in uh, Yenier and Gale 2014, maybe it's 15, I don't, is that 15 or 14? Uh, it's under review. They uh, used the, uh, this model uh, for stress drop, which is uh, function of magnitude up to the magnitude uh, five. After five is 100, and it's uh, small uh, for about 15 bars and 39 for magnitude four, and uh, 100 uh, constant for a larger magnitude. 
When we did an inversion, we came up with the value of 125, and we kept it as constant value. We didn't make a, uh, a magnitude-dependent variable. We just made it a constant value, and that inversion gave us 125. For capital value, we came up with a capital zero value. For Western North America, we came up with the factor of 0 0.0375. At the time, uh, Linda had uh, done inversion for uh, capital value for uh, using the uh, IRVT approach for uh, CY14, and she had came out with the uh, average value of 0 0.066 and uh, 0 0.0393 for uh, central value and so forth, which was pretty consistent with the value we got from an inversion. And recently, she completed all of the uh, GMPEs except uh, Idris, and she has uh, the, about 4.04 uh, value. But this is the one value we got from our inversion. So we started first with the bilinear uh, geometric model. So the uh, unknown variables that we had were the, uh, the slope uh, the, to be D1 and the hinge point. We didn't restrict this hinge point to be uh, we restrict it to be a very small number or a big number, and our inversion gave us a B value of minus 1.0374 and 96 kilometers. Uh, so again, remember these values, and i show you some figures that uh, explain this. Uh, and for the Q factor, we came up with these uh, 243 F to the power 0.446. So these are were based on our inversion. To uh, I guess we could see it well. So we did the residual. So this residual graph here shows you, and the vertical axis is the natural log of the ground motion prediction equation for West minus the uh, or, uh, estimated based on stochastic divided by natural log of the ground motion prediction in the West. And we thought if we get residual within 10%, we have done a good job. And I plotted the, the values that we got from our inversion with the blue uh, dotted line and uh, the model that uh, Gail has for inversion of the uh, NGA uh, West database uh, with the red. And I think our model came out pretty good. Uh, there are some points that uh, Gail's model is good, uh, but overall our model fits within that 10% uh, range that we were hoping, and uh, except uh, for a frequency of 5 hertz, magnitude 6, uh, distance is less than 10 kilometers, we are off that. So, but the rest of it, we pretty much fall within that 10% range that uh, we were hoping to get. So we claim that our inversion worked well. Then we went to the west for the uh, west. We didn't have time to do inversion. We just used uh, what is available. We used a uh, stress parameter of 400 bar for uh, for West, and uh, we think it's consistent with the uh, path duration that uh, Bohr and Thompson 2014 have. Uh, and uh, it's also, I think it's uh, consistent based on the, uh, this is from uh, one of the Gell's uh, presentation uh, several years ago, says that if you use the MMI value, is expected that you get a, a factor of three increase in stress drop from uh, east to west. So for inversion for west, we had 125, and here's 400, so we think it's uh, reasonable. For side amplification factor, we used the recent data that uh, Dave Bohr showed you today. Uh, table four is uh, developed for a uh, reference rock of 3,000. Uh, meter per second or three kilometers per second, and we use this model. And for a uh, path model, we used, uh, again, Bohr and Thompson uh, and the values given here. Uh, for the uh, eastern section, we use for, uh, uh, for, path, for, for path attenuation, uh, for geometric spreading, we use the factor minus 1.3 and 50, and the Q of 525 F to the power 0.45 based on uh, Atkinson and Bohr 2014. And again, the capital value recommended by Hash Hash et al. 2014 for rock reference sites were uh, of the 3,000 kilometer, 
3,000 meter per second was used in our model of uh, 0.06. So at the final, we came up with this table for updated version for our uh, uh, hybrid procedures. So we use these parameters that I just came up with, that we, we came up with uh, by doing our inversion. And this is based on uh, the most consistent and uh, correlated factors that we could find for the east in the most recent values. As we were working on this, uh, uh, Ken is very uh, adamant that we have to have, uh, for West and East, have to have uh, parameters that are consistent. One of the things that we thought might not be consistent was for West that we use 96 kilometers for a hinge point with the uh, path duration. So if you're looking at the uh, day board path duration for the West, he has two hinge points, 45 and 125 points. And we use our inversion without getting any kind of constraint on these values gave us a, a value of 96 kilometers. So we said, okay, to be consistent, we've got to use a trilinear model with the, uh, the hinge point of 45 and 125. And we use, ran our inversion model again, and uh, these are the new values we got for our trilinear model. The B value still stayed close to minus 1. B2 is minus 0.83. Again, uh, this is not as flat as the eastern United States. The western it has some uh, slope here, which makes sense. Uh, and R145 and 125, and we constrained those values. Again, we did the residual. The green line is the newest one. Uh, some, some frequency, some magnitudes got better. Some of them, uh, it got a little worse, but uh, still within the range, the acceptable range. For Eastern North America, the, uh, we didn't have the model that Bohr Atkinson had for a bilinear model. So to be consistent, again, to use the same thing for East and West, we use, we use the trilinear model, and we use the model developed by Chapman uh, et al. that he uses uh, a B value minus 1.3, and has a hinge point of 60 and 120. It's not exactly at these points. This is about 45, 50 kilometer, and this is about 120. So these are consistent with the path duration. So we, again, we state consistency. We use the, the, this model. And this shows you uh, basically from Chapman that uh, came out with these uh, factors. Again, the, the trilinear model and bilinear model if you plot them, oh, it just got messed up here. Uh, they, there is, these two are two lines. There is a red one here, and there is a green one underneath it. Uh, they're practically identical. The, uh, the blue one is Atkins Sun uh, Board 2014, but the, uh, the two models that we use for bilinear and trilinear is, uh, uh, is identical. So. But it's trilinear, so we stuck with the trilinear. So this is a table that we use for east and west to do our simulation, point source simulation. So median hybrid empirical estimates of the eastern North America ground motions are obtained by scaling the western North America empirical relationship using theoretical modification factors that we discussed. And uh, the hybrid empirical estimates are used to, in a nonlinear risk. Uh, we're going to uh, we basically use the nonlinear least square regression to come up with our GMPE. And uh, we use compared against the NGA database. This shows you some of the, the GMPEs, uh, a figure of the GMPEs that we uh, I'm showing you. This is for uh, PGA, 0.1 second, 0.2 second, and 1 second. Overall, for uh, short distances, the values compared to the 2011 model that we had is a little higher and uh, is lower in the uh, longer distance. For the uh, uh, short period, for the long period, they become reasonably close to each other. Uh, response spectrum uh, shows you here, again, comparison with 2001 model. Uh, overall, they're below, except magnitude 5 that the e, uh, the 2011 was a little bit uh, higher, but they pretty much lower. Uh, 
the saturation effect uh, becomes effective, and, uh, and uh, it's hard to see. I have more pictures. You could. This is this one. The, this is at 10 kilometers. So you could look at it at uh, magnitude seven and eight. When you get to uh, low period, magnitude seven actually gets bigger than uh, magnitude eight, slightly. But as you go farther, 30 kilometers, 100 kilometers, it gets separated. Uh, to do our model, we used two different ideas. One was using pure uh, hybrid empirical methods to come up with the curve, which is the, uh, we call the stochastic scaling, the, the red line. And then we came up with the empirical scaling, which basically we took uh, up to the magnitude six, we used the stochastic scaling, and then after magnitude six and higher, uh, we used the G uh, GMPEs in the West, and whatever the magnitude scaling between six and seven, six and eight was, we used those, and those are the, uh, the blue lines. So we decided since we don't have any data, we can't calibrate it, so uh, the, the empirical scaling would be uh, the one to choose. And again, some of these, we would like to hear your comments as well. So for uh, 10 kilometers here, again, you, you could see the uh, oversaturation. The magnitude 7 actually is bigger than the magnitude 8. But as you go further, they get separated. Uh, I, to just show you this saturation here, I highlighted. And uh, you could see that. Uh, it gets oversaturated. Now, I think we have to go with the new model that, uh, again, we have to make a decision uh, what's the best way to do it. Uh, I think there was some uh, oversaturation in the West as well, but uh, the developers didn't consider it. Now, to compare it with the NGA database, we used the flat file that was done in uh, September of 2008. Uh, we used the database mostly except the uh, site class E. And uh, we consider all locations except the Gulf Coast and made correction for site factors. Uh, again, this is the same uh, procedure that uh, uh, BSSA has done to do the site corrections. Uh, I'm not sure what the uh, other uh, doing it. I think Gail is doing the same way of correcting. He has the two parts the correction, the linear part and the nonlinear part. And there's a reference here, which is based on 760 meter per second, and is based on the PGA of the rocks. So what we did, we did the same thing. We, for uh, the site that we had, we did corrections to the 760, and we did additional correction based on the amplification factors we had to the uh, 3,000. We excluded the Gulf, which is we used the uh, the model was uh, proposed by uh, or accepted or. Uh, adopted by the NGA East by uh, Walter Mooney and, and his colleagues. And we, we ignored the Gulf Coast, and we used everything else. So this is a dysfunctional form for our attenuation model. And this shows you uh, a comparison of our attenuation model with the NGA East database. Uh, so what I have here is 0.2 second, 1 second, and 4 second. For magnitudes four, five and a half, and six. I guess I, I, we did this for the points that we have data. And our model seems to be fitting the data well. Looked at the, uh, the uh, residuals. This is the total residuals. The uh, natural log of uh, observed minus uh, simulated. And uh, it, it's, it looks very really good, except uh, close distances. We have a little bit of trend here that we are overestimating. And uh, when you go farther, there's a slightly uh, uh, positive residual. If we take some of the data out, uh, maybe go from magnitude 4.5 and, and above, this uh, bias goes away as well. So that's something else we need to think if we have to make correction for it or uh, how to handle this uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, negative residuals. For the magnitude uh, residuals, uh, again, it looks uh, pretty close to zero. With uh, There's a small trend in here for a uh, uh, low period, and, uh, and overall, it seems to be OK. We 
again, to show that the method uh, that we have works for the extreme uh, periods, uh, the idea is to develop the ground motion predictions from 0 0.01 to 10 seconds. So here I'm showing you uh, 0 0.01 to 10 seconds in comparison with the database and uh, the residuals as well. Uh, we get more uh, uh, a trend here for a uh, uh, very small, uh, for the basically PGA 0 0.01 second and, uh, and the, the 10 seconds looks pretty good. We also did the, uh, uh, the inter-event residual for magnitude and intra-event residuals and this is the total residuals and this is the event for event and site to site correction that the residuals went down. This is for 0 0.01 second, 1 second and 10 seconds. So for the future, uh, residuals show that we have we are overestimating data within 30 kilometers that we have to make correction for it. Uh, we need to look at also at the Q more carefully for high frequency. Uh, consider both bilinear and trilinear. The models I showed you, we looked at only the trilinear model. Maybe we should look at both bilinear and trilinear and see if there's any differences with those. Uh, the U use NGA East site corrections. We have done our own corrections and we plotted, we, we did the data. So we got to find out what the NGA East corrections are that will be consistent. Uh, and uh, so as soon as that comes available, we could be able to use our model and maybe calibrate against those, uh, the uh, corrected sites. And uh, Consider maybe the induced uh, event separately. We haven't done that either. So again, part of this presentation was to uh, show you what we have done and uh, get feedback. And I have a list of uh, all of us here with the email that you could uh, contact us with the uh, uh, any comments or suggestions that you might have. This is pretty much what I have for this talk. Unless you wanted me uh, get. Uh, Christine wanted me to talk about the other model for a few minutes, but maybe I should stop here. Yeah. Can you go to your residual plots because I was a little shocked by the scale and I want to make sure I know what I'm... Um, this one? Yeah. Um, so you have minus fives on your residuals. Oh, so well, it's between uh, minus two and two on log scale, typically. But isn't this... You have, I'm seeing... Those are, those are log scales. Aren't those numbers as low as minus five? No, if you, if you look at it, it's, I looked at it carefully. It's bit, typically between minus two to no, two. No, but there's a, there's a data point at. Oh, there are some data points, yeah. So, so those are yeah, well, I, I six or seven standard deviations out. So this is, uh, again, could be something with the uh, corrections. Uh, we doing uh, some of the uh, data might be having problems. Uh. <laughs> so I, I think part of what you need to do is, is to, even on this stuff here, plot it back to um, log of distance and really look at the residual at that short distance because that's again, yeah, it's a really big number. Like I didn't do a one. log of distance because you would just get jammed and you all of them toward the end. So I thought this would give them a better view of how it looks like. But we're missing the part we really care about in the first 20 yeah. kilometers there. And, and I'm worried again how, how negative that bias is. That's not a small misfit. That's a, that's a factor of two, right? It's a, a factor of two, yeah. I suspect there's a comment that it might be coming from the different geometric spreading models. Because when we did Overall, I would say our parameters are very similar to yours. The only thing I really look at and I say, oh, that's a difference, is the different geometric spreading. Because uh, in your inversion, you came up with uh, a different geometric spreading model for the west and the east. Right. And in our inversion, we found the same geometric spreading model for the west and the east. It could be interesting to see if you re-ran and assumed there was no difference in the geometric spreading model, would your residuals inside 30 kilometers go away? 
because overall, by the time you get out to, you know, they're, they're, so your geometric spreading, you had um, minus one essentially in the west to 100 kilometers, and then minus a half beyond. And in the east, you've got minus 1.3 to 50, and then minus a half beyond. So if you kind of average out that minus one going out all the way to 100 kilometers instead of being minus 1.3 to 50, right, overall you've probably got the same amount of attenuation, but the trends might be a little bit different. So it could be that if you tried to see what would happen if you assumed there was no change in geometric spreading from west to east, that it might affect that right. trend at close distances as a possibility. Uh, again, one of the things that's important is the uh, site correction. And we use the uh, BSSA 14 for our site correction. Uh, you did the same thing? Yeah. Yeah, Ken was going to come. When you guys did your fitting, um, I guess it's in the second one in particular, what was what was the, did you get residuals this big? Your, well, you're plotting your log 10. So it's the, the big difference. <laughs> 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 when we were doing the 2013 work, we saw something similar, mostly from the smaller events. That's right. If we yeah. ignore smaller events, this trend here goes away. And it turns out, I think the only model that did a really good job there was the Somerville model, which we didn't use at those magnitudes. <laughs> yeah, let, let me say, I was going to bring that up. Yeah, Sharam mentioned it, but it sort of sl slid through, right? So probably nobody noticed it. But yeah, it, it's mainly magnitude threes that are causing that. Right. So, that's you know, your generic statement, I don't know if that fits. We need to look at this spinning it by magnitude and just see what kind of trends we're getting with magnitude here. Right, yeah, because that brings up another thing that, I, that I'd forgotten. Yeah, because in your model you have a single uh, magnitude independent stress. So you don't, so you have 125 bars for the small magnitudes. That's right. Right, and that's probably why you're over predicting the small magnitude events. Because the stress for the small magnitude events is lower. Yeah, it's, it's only within about 30 or 40 kilometers, though, so wouldn't the stress drop affect things beyond that as well? It looks yeah, more like an attenuation issue, but yeah, they or, know or a focal Q depth, you know, it could be a depth than, issue. Yeah. yeah, we need to look at these to see if we can try to isolate it or if there's some simple way of doing it. And, and also, um, Again, he mentioned the Q at high frequencies, but it, it turns out this goes out to like great big distances very nicely, except when you get to really high frequencies, in which case that frequency dependent model seems to be breaking down. So there may need to be sort of a different frequency dependence of, of Q if, if we want to match data out to 500 kilometers or whatever it goes to. Yeah, it would be nice just to see that plot on a different scale. Like if you just cut out yeah, the, I, from plus five to minus five and from zero to 100 and play with that, um, then that would be interesting to look at in more, in more depth and put different magnitude bins and so on in it. So one of conclusions we just saw before the break was no fundamental difference between the east and the west at short distances and less than five hertz, right? What would your adjustment factors have been in that range? Are they near one? Do you know? Because here you're, we're seeing sort of the end result, but um, are, are, are your scale factors from your two point source models, is that near uh, one? <clears throat> we did one adjustment factor, which was in our uh, the C1 factor that we did for uh, correction, and we used the constant value for all the frequencies in period. 
Is that what you're asking me? So, so you had an equation right at the beginning that said, here's how the empirical, the hybrid method works, right? That's right. Way, way back at the beginning. The ratio. Get to it. Oh, right there. So the one on the right, that ratio, is that near one at short distances below five hertz? Close to one, I think so, yeah. Because that's what um, Gail is, is implying on that. So I think it would help us to see those things plotted up so we can see I, how I big they are. I do have them. I didn't put it in the presentation. Okay. Just further on that, and bringing it together, if you take um, EMRA's adjustments for each one of the factors, stress drop and attenuation and the like, you could actually also use um, EMRA's coefficients and factors to work out what that adjustment factor should be for each one of those things as a function of frequency. So one could make plots, for example, of that right-hand term for um, different values of stress and so on. OK, yeah, so the, my concern was that we will have only one approach. But if it's only to understand it, yeah. <laughs> we want to keep those different approaches. Um, You were studied saying you were trying to get consistency in the hinge distances, right? Consistencies in what? The the distances where you put a hinge in your right. distance scaling and and you compared it to the duration scaling. And I'm not sure why those should have should those have similar hinges? The one on the left is a duration, right? And the one on the right is geometric spreading is were you uh, so I, I thought you were suggesting you want to keep those hinge distances the same between these we two try parameters. to make it close to but that. why is there a reason maybe Dave was that you would expect those two things to break at the same place Uh, which two things? I wasn't quite clear. <laughs> the two duration functions? A, no, a duration function and a geometrical spreading function. That's what they're talking about, yeah, keeping yeah, right. the break point in a similar place. Um, I don't, I hadn't thought those were related parameters, but <clears throat> do you treat them as correlated in any way? I. I don't understand physically why, like, the duration has such a strong break point right there. Was physically what's going on with that? Uh, you know, if it's a, if it's a case of uh, critical angle reflections or something that are coming in, I mean, that kind of thing is a physical basis for it. Then the geometrical spreading would be tied with the duration. Uh, in this case, you know, I fit those things completely by eye, just completely subjective. And uh, but. but Whenever you have a breakpoint like this, and if you then look at the simulations as a function of distance, you're going to see those effects. They're going to be weird. You know, there's going to be kind of a kink and stuff. And so, uh, if you have different breakpoints, different for the duration for the geometrical spreading, your your attenuation of ground motion with distance is going to have those kinks as well. Well, we ended up seeing it in our figures that it didn't really matter. Uh, so it came out. Pretty close. Just as a follow-up on that, depending on how you know you define duration, then they could very well be tied. So, as I remember, Dave and I looked at that in uh, 1995 when we did our paper, and we were calculating duration basically as the duration that would give you the correct relationship between the time domain and the frequency domain when you went through the stochastic model. And so, then in that case, there is a clear reason why if you put uh, breakpoints in the geometric spreading model in the stochastic simulations, you'll ex you could expect to see the same breakpoints in the calculated duration um, that you infer, and in fact we did.
Thank you very much. Oh, you yes, that's true. Oh, I asked you. I asked you. <laughs> no, no, that's true. I forgot. So there's a, a couple of other models that we were going to consider uh, in addition. So there's a, your your model from 2005. I don't know if you have a slide on that one, but uh, shall we? Uh, well, shall, well, how do you say that? Shahjui. Shahjui. Yeah. And, okay. So. So okay. we Quick notes on additional. One more model that uh, my PhD student working on was the hybrid uh, empirical draw motion using hybrid broadband. So it's hybrid hybrid procedure. Uh, and basically, just give you a summary of what it is. Uh, he used the uh, uh, hybrid method, and he, he used the broadband, the hybrid broadband for stimulation technique instead of point source model. So uh, high frequency synthetics using stochastic models are generated and combined with the low frequency synthetics produced using a kinematic source model and the deterministic wave propagation. And uh, Developed a model for magnitude 5 to 8, uh, used the RJD from 2 to 2000, and for the reference rock. Basically, used the uh, low frequency green function. Uh, we used uh, Paul Spudik uh, ComSense uh, model that he helped us uh, uh, learn and use. And uh, he used the uh, uh, boards for high frequency part using the cross tone model, faulting mechanism. To desired moment magnitude, faulting area, uh, station value. Using these, combining them, uh, came up with the hybrid uh, synthetics and uh, show you a sample, for example, for magnitude seven, shows you the slip distribution and the contour map shows you the rise time. Scaled the stress drop, we use a, a root mean square of about 200, 250 bars, it shows you the rise time and the slip rate and uh, similar for magnitude six and a half. Again, shows you how it combined the two, uh, low frequency and high frequency, followed the procedure by, uh, suggested by Hart uh, for different magnitudes. The crossover is at uh, five is at three, five and a half, three, and so forth. And this shows you the, uh, the, uh, the ground motion predictions that we came up. Uh, and we, again, we checked it with our database for different frequencies. Uh, it's, uh, well, the residual came up. We didn't have any the great thing about this. Is, uh, came up with the model. We just compared it with the data and looked great. We didn't have to do any fudge factor, any scaling. It just came up and uh, it seemed like it fit the data real well. And I just compared it with the database, uh, the, uh, what is it called? Uh, the program that uh, Nico uh, put together. And I compared it with the, uh, the other hybrid uh, uh, broadband procedure by Art Frankel. And it's for magnitude six and uh, looked pretty close to it. So. Having two methods uh, working independently and coming out with uh, close answers just give us con confidence that we either both are wrong or we both correct. So, and uh, uh, my student wanted to make sure that I acknowledge these uh, Paul Spudik, uh, Martin Mai, and Hugo that helped him develop this model. So that's basically what I was going to say. Just a minute on that model. So if you have questions. Uh, we could talk about it after the talk, <laughs> and uh, and I could take your uh, feedback back to my PhD student who's graduating uh, this semester, actually. And we have a paper uh, submitted to DSSA is going to be published, and I heard yesterday that it's accepted its revision, so hopefully it's going to be published. So we haven't heard as much about that GMP, but it's going to be part of our Simon's map tomorrow and we'll show comparisons as you saw those of you who have used the tool will look at that tomorrow. Okay, thank you Sharam. Uh, we need to move on. Our next speaker is going to be Art Frankel talking about uh, high school model, graduate school for <laughs> Okay, and uh, so the mouse is here. Can you hear me okay? 
I would call this the advanced placement kindergarten model. <laughs> Well, Sharam sort of covered everything I need to say about the method, so I won't say no. Um, well, this let's see. This slide basically shows a flow chart of how this works. Uh, at long periods, we have these deterministic uh, synthetics, so we make a Green's function using a frequency wave number integration code. This is for flat layered model. We have a random slip that follows a, a wave number to the minus two power spectrum. So that's the long period part. At the short period part, we're using uh, basically uh, summing up these um, point source stochastic uh, Green's functions using uh, Dave SM SIM co uh, code to make the point sources. And then we sum these over uh, the fall plane. We convolve them with a relative slip function that I developed in 1995. And then we combine this with a match filter uh, to make the broadband synthetics. There's a lot of similarities of this method to uh, the Graves and Petarka method, but there are some significant differences. So I was thinking about this talk and I say, well, you know, it's going to be reading a lot of word slides and uh, might be more boring than most of my talks, but uh, so what? Um, some people might argue with that. So I've made uh, broadband synthetics uh, from magnitude four and a half up to seven and a half. Uh, the key thing, uh, one key aspect is that this crossover frequency between the deterministic and the stochastic um, goes to higher frequencies as you go to lower and lower magnitudes. So in other words, directivity effects become uh, more prominent uh, at higher frequencies for the smaller magnitudes. And this basically just relates to how the corner frequency changes. And this is basically the same procedure I used in the 2009 paper for the Western U.S. I compared the results to the NGA West 1 results. Also, I've compared these to the spectral accelerations and Fourier amplitude spectra for Northridge, Loma Prieta, and Ismet. And this was published in a Hartzell paper. Uh, I've also compared the uh, essays uh, with the Riviera de Lu and Saguenay essays. For the stochastic part, I use a 200 bar stress drop. Now, what does that mean? That means the 200 bars is what I use when I make the point source synthetics um, from the stochastic model. I use the same geometrical, and this one key of the model is that the stress drop is constant with magnitude, both in the stochastic part and the deterministic part. I think this is really cr critical. And I think this is fundamental to what we see in the data. Uh, the geometrical spreading was the same as I used in uh, the Frankel et al. 96 uh, attenuation relation, which was based on point source. I, based, I have used what uh, kept it the same. This is from Atkinson and Bohr, 1995. Uh, R to the minus one out to 70 kilometers, flat from 70 to 130, and R to the minus 0.5 after that. I used the same Q model um, from Atkinson and Bohr, 95. Now, I'll about two years ago at this venue, I gave a talk showing uh, how the Charlevoix data is consistent with R to the minus one. I'll show some more of that at the end of this talk so we can go through this. Uh, so this data from the Charlevoix earthquakes really supports R to the minus one out to 80 kilometers. I scaled the fault area from the western U.S. fault areas that I used in the 2009 study. Uh, I scaled them based on twice the static stress drop for the, the east. I use a 270 by 270 meter sub-event size. Uh, the results for the stochastic are not, not sensitive to this at all. I used a fractal distribution of stress drop, hard rock site condition, VS30, 2800 meters a second, kappa 0 0.006. The uh, for the deterministic finite fault portion, I used the Southeast Canada crustal model that Hartzell uh, used in 1994. I used the, the CHU frequency wave number integration code. Used the same sub-event size as the stochastic. You have to use fairly small sizes here because I want to capture the directivity effects even for the small earthquake, so you need to have a small sub-event sub size. Use a fractal slip on the fault. And one important thing are the rupture velocity variations across the fault. And I'm using uh, a case where the rupture velocity is proportional to the slip variation. So places where there's high slip, 
the rupture will initiate sooner than areas of, of lower slip. And uh, one key is that the, the dynamic stress drop is consistent with seismic moment. Now, the uh, dynamic stress drop is proportional to the slip velocity at any point divided by the rupture velocity. So I used an average slip velocity of 5.4 meters a second, uh, which is twice of what I found fit the NGA West data. So again, the twice the dynamic stress drop of the Western US. And uh, I chose that 2.7 meters a second. It fits the NGA West one data very well, gives similar rise times as Somerville et al's uh, rise time collection from 1999. I've tried various focal mechanisms, and, um, including vertical strike slip and 45 degree thrust faulting in this. So this shows just one example of, uh, for the magnitude seven and a half, what one of the slip realizations looks like. And this is fractal distribution, uh, K to the minus two spectrum, wave number spectrum. And here's a, on the bottom is a rupture initiation time. There's quite a lot of roughness in this. You can see areas of, of low slip have relatively late uh, initiation times. I think it's very important for the long period to put a lot of uh, variation in the rupture initiation time to get the long period prop, uh, proper amplitudes. This is a velocity model for, uh, that I use. This is from Hartzell et al, 1994. This uses a frequency independent cube. And you can see from 1.4 kilometers depth to six, it's got a QS of 500 and below that QS of 2000. I have not tried any other velocity models. And you've probably seen this kind of slide before, how you combine the deterministic and stochastic synthetics to make the broadband synthetics. So here's an example for the western US, a magnitude seven and a half. This is a site three kilometers away off the north end, I think, of the fault. Here's a deterministic. We see this this very distinct forward directivity pulse here in the deterministic uh, seismograms. Here's the stochastic. Uh, this is basically just this envelope uh, uh, function here. So what you do is you low pass filter the deterministic, high pass filter the stochastic, and add them together. You got your broadband seismogram from zero to 20 hertz. This is a match filter at 0.8 hertz here. The key thing is with the deterministic, we're capturing these forward directivity pulses that you really don't capture in the stochastic models. We're also capturing the radiation pattern effects uh, too. So uh, it, it could be very important to the spectral accelerations to maintain this physically uh, realistic phase that in the seismograms. So uh, we're basically calcul I'm calculating the spectral accelerations directly from the broadband seismogram. Distance, distance metric is closest distance to the rupture. I have receivers distributed in azimuth and distance. And for this case, I'm just showing the geometrical average of the SAs from the two horizontal components. This describes the various fault dimensions and depth ranges. Uh, for four and a half, I'm not using a point source. I still have a finite source, 1.2 kilometers on a side. I consider both strike slip and thrust, uh, different depth ranges, five and a half. The source size is about four kilometers on a side. Um, and I've considered different depth ranges. Most of the tops of ruptures that I'm using are between four and five kilometers. I don't go above that. Uh, six and a half is about 14 kilometers by 10. Uh, seven and a half, I consider two different aspect ratios of the fault. One, a thin aspect ratio, 119 kilometers by 12 kilometers. Basically, I scaled what I use in the Western US, which was from the Hanks and Bakken uh, scaling relation. I scaled that so that each dimension was shorter to, to, maintain, to get twice the static stress drop in this case. And I also have the thick aspect ratio, 80 by 25 kilometers. And that goes from five to 30 kilometers depth. Okay, so let me show you some results. I showed these at the conference call we had a couple months ago, and I have a lot more simulations that I'll show uh, later on, but this, this really illustrates the major points. So this is five hertz spectral acceleration as a function of distance. Black is for four and a half, green is for five and a half, red six and a half, and blue is seven and a half, out to a thousand kilometers. 
and the black lines are the values predicted from the Frankel et al. point source simulations. And uh, the cool thing is that larger distances, the finite fault simulations basically follow the point source simulations, which you would expect. As you get closer in, then the, the finiteness of the fault comes in, and you start to get the saturation. So you can see that things bunch up, and you get the, uh, the seven and a half spectral accelerations are not much close in, are not much greater than the six and a half. If you look, uh, if you compare these to the uh, Atkinson Bohr 2006, I have two stress drops plotted here. So the, the dashed line is for 140 bars, the dot dash is for 200 bars. You can see that um, the Atkinson and Bohr 2006 decays more steeply with distance for the four and a half uh, out to 70 kilometers. And then, uh, then the simulations and also the point source result. So the simulations at these frequencies are basically controlled by the stochastic part. This is this R to minus one. So this difference is mostly caused by the difference in the geometrical spreading from zero to 70 kilometers. And again, I think there's, there's good evidence in the Charlevoix data set that the true geometrical spreading should be R to the minus one. So I guess that covers the five hertz here. Going to one hertz, oh, I guess I should just say, so the values that I have for five hertz are generally higher than the Atkinson and Bohr uh, 2006. Uh, we go to one hertz. Uh, it's pretty interesting here. If we look at the simulations, they're somewhere generally between uh, the Atkinson and Bohr 2006 and the Franco et al. results, at least out to 200 kilometers here. And um, let's see. So if you look at the four and a half, when you're really close, all these, the simulations, the Franco et al., the Atkinson and Bohr are all about the same. But it's, the simulations show much deeper decay at one hertz than the point source stochastic simulations did. And this is basically because of effects such as radiation pattern of the source that you see at one hertz, but you don't see at higher frequencies. Also, directivity effects. If the ruptures tend to, to rupture upward, uh, you're going to see a steeper decay of amplitude with distance. This is not what I would call geometrical spreading. It may look like a, sort of an effective geometrical spreading, but it's really other factors, such as the radiation pattern and directivity that are doing this, and I'll talk more about this later. So this causes the steeper decay of the um, of the synthetic, and it matches fairly well the Atkinson and Bohr one hertz. <laughs> I don't know what that's all about. Um, and again, uh, you can see the saturation effects as you get close in, especially for the magnitude seven and a half. You see this strong moho reflection here uh, that becomes uh, somewhat blurred out with the six and a half because of the finite faulting, and it. And basically at seven and a half, that's, you're getting close to the crossover point, which is at 0.8 hertz. So I think most of this is due to the, the stochastic part of the formulation. Uh, I did a cursory comparison of the data. Uh, I basically took the data from the, I think it's the July version of the database, and just took uh, stations that had VS30s greater than equal, or equal to 760 meters a second. Those are the triangles here, and this is, uh, I plotted it once from 4.0 magnitude to 4.9. This is, so this is for one hertz plotted uh, on top of the simulated results, which are the, the solid and open symbols here. Uh, just wanted to see if they're reasonable in the same ballpark. I haven't done any residual calculations of this at all. And uh, I think you can see the data brackets, the simulations approximately here. If you go to five and a half, uh, one hertz, I took out the Sparks, Oklahoma earthquake because um, I thought it would, might be different because it's uh, probably induced. Again, you can see that uh, your, the data are bracketing the simulation results, uh, certainly from 100 to 1,000 kilometers. At five hertz, uh, we're doing okay. There's this clump of data here, um, which I'm not sure what's going on. It, past 700 kilometers. I looked a little bit, of, and I think some of these are some of these, uh, are these uh, 
um, potentially induced earthquakes or maybe there are earthquakes that have to transverse the Gulf, Gulf Coast. Again, I, I, don't, I don't know if there's any Gulf Coast sites where VS-30 is greater than eight, or 760 meters a second. I would doubt it. But certainly have to look at what's going on here and try to figure that out. You don't see that problem with the five and the magnitude fives. Again, here's the data. In, tri in the open triangles for five and a half, for five to 5.8, and you can see that the data bracket, the simulation. Let's look specifically at some of the uh, results for the simulations. This is for magnitude seven and a half. The open symbols are for a thin rupture, this, um, and the, uh, the open black symbols, the open red symbols are for thick rupture, same focal mechanism, strike slip. And you can see some difference here, but close in, there's not, not much difference. As you get farther away, it appears the thick rupture produces somewhat higher one-second spectral acceleration than the uh, thin rupture. And at 0.2 seconds, you see that same basic trend, but it, it's not a huge effect. And this shows the results of all the simulations I've done so far for seven and a half. So I have the thin and thick rupture. I have the thrust fault towards the stations, away from the stations, uh, the hypocenter at the northern end and the southern end, and also use the different slip functions. So this gives you somewhat of an idea of the spread of uh, spectral accelerations you can get from these different uh, scenarios. Six and a half, uh, this shows the one second spectral acceleration. Uh, interesting thing here, the, uh, the thrust close in, the thrusts are higher, uh, spectral accelerations and the strike slip. When you go to larger distances, there's not much of a difference between the three cases. Uh, for magnitude five and a half, here's a bunch of different cases, strike slip, thrust, different depths. Uh, interesting thing that the, the lowest values are for a thrust that's, that's uh, rupturing away from the station. Not too surprising. And uh, this is for one second. Uh, there's surprisingly not much difference if you have a, a fairly deep rupture at 13 kilometers at the base of the rupture. That's the solid black symbols versus shallower uh, thrust. One thing that's interesting, uh, if you look at the long period, three seconds, there's quite a bit difference in the distance decay depending on the depth of the rupture. And so the black symbols are for a hypocentral depth of 13 kilometers. So the rupture is nine to 13 kilometers depth versus the open symbols are for eight to, uh, four to eight kilometers depth. And so I think this difference is probably due to surface waves. In the shallower rupture, you're at these distances, you're probably dominated by surface waves that decay less deeply than the body waves at the deeper things. But we need to look at, I'd be curious, I had not, didn't have time to look at the data to see if you can see this in the data, but uh, uh, that would be the prediction from the synthetics. Now, my plan is to deliver these GMPs by specifying median SA values and distance spins in each period. Uh, I don't know how to capture this MOHO bounce in a formula. Maybe somebody else does, but um, so I'm just planning to deliver these median values. Uh, so this is for one second period, four and a half, five and a half, six and a half, and seven and a half, and do all those, include all those cases that I showed uh, when I'm doing finding the median. So again, you can see the saturation at the close in higher magnitudes. And this shows the results at various periods from 0.01 second to three second. For magnitude seven and a half, you can see that at longer distances, these things sort of collapse as the higher frequency gets killed faster than the low frequency. And just to review this, this issue about geometrical spreading in the, in the first 70, 80 kilometers, I want to sh uh, show what I, sh basically what I showed a couple years ago which is an, uh, an analysis of coda normalized S-wave amplitudes from Charlevoix earthquakes. And I want to acknowledge that this data came from the Geological Survey of Canada. They have some really good websites that I enjoyed getting the data from. So this shows the data set, uh, seven earthquakes. Uh, that's the solid symbols here. And uh, I think there's what, six or seven stations. And this, is, this one is the Riviera de Lou earthquake. Am I running out of time or anything like that? No, no, you're I'm sort of 
calling. Uh, what time is the baseball game? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the advantage of the, I, I don't want to get into this code of normalization thing, but you're basically dividing the S wave Fourier spectral amplitude by the coda wave amplitude at a fixed time after the origin time. And that approximately gets rid of your site response and your source spectrum. So you can combine events, uh, data from different events, different magnitudes on one plot. So this shows the results at one hertz. Uh, as a function of hypocentral distance for six of these earthquakes here. And I just fit these with a simple power law of distance and found the best fit is minus 1.58 uh, for this. So that's uh, quite a bit steeper than R to the minus one. But the strange thing is, as you go to higher frequencies, uh, the slope gets less steep. So at five hertz, it's R to the minus 1.35. For 14 hertz, it's R to the minus 1.05. And you can do a t-test to look at the significance of these differences between the 14 hertz and the 1 hertz. Is they have different slopes uh, with a 98% confidence level. So what's going on here? Why? Um, so this whole concept of geometrical spreading, the true geometrical spreading of your structure versus your apparent geometrical spreading is an important issue. And so what could make the geometrical spreading steeper at low frequency? Let me say this, change that. Uh, what could make the observed amplitude decay steeper at one hertz than at 14 hertz? Well, one thing are, could be radiation pattern, directivity effects that you're going to see at one hertz, but at high frequencies, 14 hertz, you're probably not going to see those because of scattering is going to wipe out the radiation pattern is going to wipe out the directivity effects. So here I show some results of doing 1D crustal structure modeling uh, for the Riviera de Lue earthquake. So this is again Fourier amplitude, one hertz Fourier amplitude as a function of hypocentral distance. The solid is the observed. Uh, I did a whole set of synthetics. The triangles are for southward and upward rupture. And basically, you, they match the data fairly well. Uh, uh, you can see that this nearest site is, is somewhat above the trend of the other data points. I think that's because the rupture is rupturing upwards towards that site. If you do synthetics for a northward updip rupture that ruptures away from that site, the amplitude gets lower. So uh, this line here corresponds to R to minus 1.5. So I think these steeper than R to the minus 1 observed decays are really caused by a combination of radiation pattern effects and also directivity effects. So I'd like to think that this model is a physically plausible model. Uh, they use the flat layered synthetics from the finite faulting. I have realistic slip distributions and rupture histories trying to capture directivity effects, forward directivity pulses, for example, radiation pattern effects, uh, variations with slip distribution and hypocenter, crustal and moho reflections, and also surface waves. Many of these effects cannot be uh, matched or modeled with the stochastic method. It uses constant stress drop scaling with moment, both a constant slip velocity with moment for the deterministic part and constant Brun stress drop with moment for the stochastic part. Uh, the stochastic portion has the finite faulting scaling consistent with omega minus two scaling model, uh, where the high frequency spectral energy at any frequency above a corner frequency is proportional to the fault area. I think this is a very uh, straightforward result um, that we see in omega minus two scaling and makes sense when we think about asperities causing um, the high frequency. Uh, so the, the number of asperities will scale as the fault area and that should that should basically say your high frequency energy should scale as a fault area. Uh, it produces saturation with magnitude at close in distances due to finite faulting. This saturation is less prominent at lower frequencies, which, which is what we see in the data uh, for the Western US and other places. And it uses R to the minus one spreading out to 70 kilometers for the stochastic portion, which I think is consistent with the observations from Charleroi. That's it. And Ask questions, throw tomatoes or whatever.
questions for Art? Early on, you said you limited the top of rupture to be greater than four kilometers. Why? Well, the main reason is it worked in Western U.S. and National <laughs> <Okay>. GA. <laughs> But, but does something start to go bad? or, or, or I was or, worried about when you get very shallow depths uh, that the surface, that the 1D models could produce uh, much too much surface wave energy that's seen in the data. For example, at three seconds, I didn't need to go above three kilometers or four kilometers depth to match the three second energy. Actually, it's a good point. Like in the Hanford stuff I did, I went out to 10 seconds. I could actually show you some of the results. I don't want to go into this too much, but just to show that I stopped at three kilometers for the Hanford uh, stuff. This shows response spectra for a site um, at Hanford. The black lines are from synthetics for a 1D model that stopped at three kilometers depth. The blue circles are the predictions from NGA West 1. I'm just, I just put this in here just so show that this method does a good job of getting out the 10 second period. And I, like I said, I stopped things, I think in this case, at three kilometers depth. I know Rob has you know, this method where you change the, the rise times and you do all these other things in order to sort of minimize the effects maybe of the, the top layers. But uh, I think originally I was sort of inspired by Ken Campbell always had the, that three kilometers as a top of rupture. But, but um, I thought it goes with work works and I think uh, above the three kilometers apparently that's not generating significant energy in the frequency bands we want, we see. And you have not, no change in like rise time proppers in the, no, in the top part? No. Okay. I kept it all the same. Questions? Yeah. Well, uh, a couple of questions just on that, the parameterization. Um, so you, you said uh, constant or uh, you know, constant dynamic stress drop, uh, which means that the slip velocity is constant as a function of moment. Now is that slip velocity varies across the fault, right? Yeah. But that's just like average over the event. Right. I mean, I at each point of the fault, I have to calculate a rise time, right? So I have the final slip, I have the slip velocity, and I calculate the rise time that way. And I do have some variation in it across the fault. And when I think about it, maybe this is the venue for this, but constant dynamic stress drop with moment almost has to be true. Because if you think about it, dynamic stress drop is the tectonic stress minus the dynamic frictional stress. So for smaller earthquakes, they're going to have the same tectonic stress, presumably. And so if you look at the dynamic frictional stress, why would that be different? on a patch of fault when it's generating magnitude three versus if it continues seven. If anything, you think the fault might weaken as slip proceeds at that point. And so you, you, if anything, you think the stress drop, the dynamic stress drop would increase with seismic moment. But if you think, if you don't believe in these ideas of fluid pressurization on the fault or anything like that, you know, the fault spot doesn't change when it's a magnitude three versus a magnitude seven. The tectonic stress doesn't change. So I would say, to me at least, it seems very logical that you have constant stress drop, dynamic stress drop scaling with seismic moment. Right. Well, and does, so that means that your your rise time is basically scaling with slip yeah. across the fault. Um, which, yeah, I that sounds fine. <laughs> I think that, I'm um, relieved you said that. Yeah, right, for whatever it's worth. Um, I also was curious about uh, the, the rupture speed. Do you, do you have like a, an average, you must have an average. Uh, yeah, I have an average, uh, I think most of these is it's like 2,800 or 2,500 uh, meters a second. And then I have a certain uh, standard deviation, 20%. And then I do the secant rupture thing to, to give that standard deviation. I do have a quick question. On, so on these different magnitudes, you, you had the six, the thin models and all that. 
how do you define the do you, do you use a self similar relationship for a magnitude area and then how do you constrain the dimensions it's all self similar scaling um, so the area for the the earthquakes for six and a half to four and a half it's all the area scale let's see the moment scales is an area to the three half power for all those and for the seven and a half basically I'm using the dimensions of the Hanks and Bakken for the western U.S. and I'm scaling that for eastern U.S. by shrinking both dimensions. And for the 80 by 25 kilometer size, that was, I, uh, Leonard had that dimension, so I tried that too. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, actually, I'm, so for your thick and thin, they, they have the same area? No. Or not? Okay. They actually, do not have the same area. Um, I don't think I didn't work it out. Maybe they do, but uh, that was well. The idea. No, I, I actually, I uh, yeah, I didn't catch that when it went by. So your thin model is based right. on scaling Hanks and Bakken, yeah, by this factor of two stress drop. Yeah, I'm not so technically you could say well the stress drop is really the width of the fault, the static, so. I don't, like I showed in these, even with these two quite different rupture dimensions, there wasn't much difference in the ground motion. Um, yeah, when you, yeah, you had shown that, I was actually curious for this, so this is a seven and a half, um, but it's, this is really going to have potentially a larger effect at the long periods, right? And I think you showed a plot at one second, but that's, Still in the kind of stochastic part? Yeah, I think I've looked at the three second. No, it's not in the, no. Well, one second, that's right. It will be some of the stochastic part. I've looked at the three seconds. They're a, a bit different, but um, yeah. not that much different. Okay. What can I say? I should, I could make a slide of that and send it to you. I could just back off, but could you say again, what, what did you do with Hanks and Bakken for the magnitude scale, area scaling? Okay, when I did the uh, 2009 paper for Western U.S., I used the Bakken and Hanks scaling for the length, and then at that time, you just ruptured the whole seismogenic depth, okay. right, for that. So that's what I used for this. So what I did for East is I just shrank each dimension by uh, the factor, what is it, the cube root of two, you know, for the stress drop, because, uh, you know, in the formula for stress drop, uh, the dimensions have to shrink right, in order to do that. But you could argue whether that's appropriate for the length. It's probably not, thinking about it, but it would for the width, because stress drop, static stress drop depends on the width of the fault, technically, not the length. But but is, is this it's essentially a higher static stress drop, right? Yes. And how is that number calibrated or? or how did you decide how much? To well, originally hit? for the 2009 Western U.S., it's a good question. How do you calibrate this whole thing? So, originally I started with Wells and Coppersmith size for magnitude six and a half. So they have a length and a, and a width, and then I guess they had an area. So I started with that as my dimensions, and that was the critical area that I scaled everything below and going up. I used the Hanks and Bakken for the seven and a half. But everything from six and a half down is basically scaled from Wells and Coppersmith using this moment proportional area to the three halves power. So that's how I got all these things and all the sub event size, it's all scaled self similarly. So when you clear? go to yeah, but when you go to the east, you're now shrinking, shrinking them all down to get a higher static stress and, and how did you choose the higher static stress drop that you wanted? The 200 get? bars? Yeah. What did I, how did I choose that? Well, I thought there was a lot of literature on the intensities that said uh, the stress drop had to be a lot of factor of two. I think the results I've seen from Gal lately, um, you know, stress drops of what, 150, 180 bars, something like that. So I thought it was a reasonable thing to do factor of two. And then I said, well, let's see how it fits the data at the end of the day. Okay, so but it's not optimized. It's, it's, it's chosen not optimized. It's purely okay. chosen. All right. So but, but you did show plots of data fits for a series of events. Yeah, but I mean I haven't done that quantitatively yet. Yeah. Okay. Just 
Yeah, I guess just by way of, of comment, a really interesting presentation. So I, I think that, uh, yeah, the stress drop, kind of some of the stuff that I've had in the past, anywhere from factor two to three, I'm probably leaning more towards factor three. Um, and it is a good question, yeah. So how do you calibrate the, the stress? So I think we probably have a very similar stress factor. I might put it more close to 300 than 200, but rather similar. Um, I think that uh, we analyzed a lot of the same earthquakes in the Charlevoix, like the Atkinson Bohr 2014 would have used those same events, I'm sure. And so I think what was really interesting about what you um, shown is that um, your analysis is suggesting that the R to the minus 1.3, which we tend to see in actually both the East and the West, uh, may be actually a result of other things that's showing up as an apparent geometric spreading. Right. And I think that that's actually quite likely. So, so thank you. Sure. Yeah, that, that's the thing we, I, in the previous workshops, we tried to use effective geometric spreading, so it's kind of a catch-all for those things. Uh, well, it just, uh, you know, it's an example of something that you want to have a physical basis, yeah. a physical understanding for. And if I think uh, the practical ramifications are if you, you want to use, you don't want to necessarily use a geometrical, an effective geometrical spreading found at one hertz to mm -hmm. five hertz or ten hertz. You want to be careful about that. Well, uh, just, Gail, you reminded me of, of one other comment or, or question. Um, what kind of an effect do you think the velocity structure has on this apparent geometric spreading. So you mentioned, I think, directivity and radiation pattern. Yeah, I think it was what, in 1991 or something, I published a paper on where I found a steeper geometrical spreading, and I tried a 1D model, and I could get a steeper geometrical spreading. And I think that's a combination of radiation pattern, and also your waves are getting reflected when they're going up and they're getting reflected from the interfaces and some of the energy is getting knocked out. And uh, the question is, why isn't that working at high frequencies? You know, why don't, why is, I mean, you can see the radiation patterns disappearing at high frequencies. Directivity effects, will, okay, that gets rid of that, but you still think there might be these layers uh, that could affect the high frequency. You know, if these interfaces are fairly broad, maybe they're, the velocity changes are occurring over distances large compared to the wavelength for this short period, and it's not. Re so I'm, I guess I'd appeal to frequency-dependent rate of reflection coefficients, possibly. I don't know. But, you know, but uh, and also, you know, we're talking about these flat layers with uniform velocities. Why don't we talk about gradients in the velocity? That's going to focus energy. That's going to change things. It might increase the amplitude of distances compared to r to the minus one. Sure, sure. I, but I was just thinking even with a, I mean, it could be a gradient, as long as it's laterally yeah. homogeneous yeah. or a layered structure, that just because of the refraction of the direct waves is going to tend to maybe boost up your amplitudes in close and maybe, you know, potentially give you a... It would be nice if we actually tried frequency. to work this out. Well, <laughs> but I think, well, but I, I, in your results, it, it looked like that was in there. So say like, uh, you know, what you're four and a half at one second period, that's basically on the deterministic side, right? It's, right. And it shows a fairly right. steep. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this, what's nice about this model, it has, it's a physically plausible model that sort of explains a lot of things that we've been talking about, that Gail yeah. was talking about, R to the minus 1.3 does that for the longer period. The, the double corner model is sort of explained with this kind of method. So, and I mean, you could, I could see fans of the stochastic modeling say, oh, well, you got pretty much the same as we did, so we don't need all these effects or something. <laughs> but I'd like to think of it as the, it's supplying some physical underpinnings to some of the things that are used in the, in the yeah. stochastic model. And I think, you know, I worry that the stochastic model does not contain the directivity effects, and that's what I was criticizing for, because you know, at longer periods, I think things are more than just an envelope, you know, with random phase. And I think we can do better than that. Yeah. And it might be important when we're doing the, the uh, pseudo-spectral accelerations.
the phase might be important, and I think we need to worry about that when we're scaling things up. Well, it, in, in particular, as I was trying to think about, for example, with directivity, your four and a half has dimensions of a kilometer yeah. or so, right? So you don't have a, much fault to actually get directivity. Certainly you would have radiation pattern effects. Well, you see, I think you see directivity with the, the Riviera de Lure is quite, was that a 4.6 or something like that? So Yeah, you well, see but, and, and do you see it, but can you actually see that in your simulation? That where you yeah. say this is directivity, you know, Yeah, I mean, I showed those one hertz amplitudes from the synthetics, and they vary depending on whether it had it rupturing towards that station or rupturing away. Yeah. So it does make a difference even at 4.6. Is. Yes, uh, Kim. Uh, the near surface is uh, possibly generating some artificial surface waves in the yeah. over three kilometers. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I believe that we see some of the some something similar in in, in the simulations that we've been running in in the exercise. So, uh, do you have any recommendation on on how to avoid those to to make a, a a gradient instead of uh, a discontinuous layers, or how would we go about that? I don't know. I, I, I basically think the rupture process must be really slowing down. The, the slip velocity must be sl slowing down quite radically as you get near the surface. And it's, you know, I don't think it's radiating significant energy in the frequency bands we need to worry about. I, you know, Rob tries to handle that by lowering the. the uh, we increase the rise time and lower the rupture velocity. But, you know, I know in a lot of simulations when we've gone to the surface, it just produces ridiculous ground motions and at longer periods. And uh, I think when you start rupturing through sediment, <laughs> like a, that's not going to generate any significant strong ground motions, I don't think. I think we see the same thing. You actually using Rob's rupture generator, so that's what makes mm -hmm. me think it might it might be something related to the crustal structure. And that and was I, worse for vertical strike slip to the I surface. I also of think what happens also is we have these flat layered models. Well, that's not what the Earth looks like. I mean, there's lateral variations. You've done work on random variations. I've done work on random variations, and we don't have that in the model. And that's going to knock down a lot of the stuff that we see. So. You know, what I've done is try to transfer a lot of that randomness in the path into the source, you know, make it more random in the source. I mean, the bottom line is matching the data, you know, and if you let it rupture, I find at least with the parameters I use, if I let it rupture to the surface, it just produces PGVs of like six meters a second or something like that. I, you know, we don't have any data to really support that um, as a median ground motion, at least. Just to add to that, you're, you're right in our approach or my approach, the way that I've handled that is to basically try to perturb or, or adjust the parameters of the rupture so that it diminishes the radiation. Uh, and it's because of that same reason. Uh, for the east, in the, and this actually is related to what Kim said, the, the current rupture generator that we're using for the east does not include those variations in the near surface. And the reason why is there, there's no data in the east to, to constrain that. We, you know, we don't have large ruptures that come up to the surface. And so my, I just made a decision, all right, I'm not going to put it in there. Uh, but exactly as Kim said, we're now generating for the east. If we have that rupture come up to the surface, we get whopping ground motions. Well, I have to say, I haven't tried it, putting the source really shallow in this hard rock kind of velocity model. Maybe it wouldn't blow up, but any of our 3D models that have sediments on top, it, it just causes havoc if you, if you try to rupture it to the surface. Okay. John? John Adams here. I mean, we certainly Net closer. Uh, John Adams here. We certainly have the Ungava rupture, which came right up to the surface in hard rock. And we see quite a lot of earthquakes in the magnitude twos and three ranges in the top few kilometers. So I don't think we could ignore that. The other thing is, if it's RG surface waves, then the closer it gets to the surface, the higher the frequency, right? So it becomes more and more interesting around the one second mark. 
Yeah, I think we need to look at that. Um, like I showed for the um, five and a half, it made a difference at three second period, but you're right, as you go shallower, yeah, I haven't done runs in a hard rock crustal structure, so maybe it would be a more uh, reasonable kind of values, but it, it would be very important to the east. Okay, so we're now in the, the remaining time is uh, discussions for another uh, 15 minutes or so. Thank you, Art. Um, there's one question I'd like to bring back is that globally, so, so by the way, everybody, tomorrow we'll start again looking at all those different GMPs and how they compare over a wide range of distance and all that, and we'll compare them on almost the same basis, magnitude, distance, and sites roughly about the same. What we need to consider is those models are limited to a certain distance and that cannot be pushed beyond that and how are we going to extrapolate, what are we going to go, do to go to a thousand. So some of them is by choice and they could be projected to longer distances. I'm thinking of the um, Asani model, Asani and Atkinson, that's, that this one is limited because the the base model for the Western U.S. don't have that in there. Is there a way to extrapolate, to extend those, or are, they, are we just completely not going to be able to use those models uh, at larger distances? Because our mandate is from zero to a thousand kilometers. So, Gail, you should have a mic that Rob had. Yeah, I mean, you, you could extend to a larger distance just by making an assumption as to how you wanted the attenuation to behave beyond that based on a general Q thing. So you could extend it. So will you? <laughs> I think all of the models uh, are, we talked before, are pretty unreliable out there, and we ought to just build something on, uh, on how they can extrapolate that's reasonable, because the, the, the key is to not get an unreasonable scaling out there. Yes. So you blow up stuff from 1,500 kilometers or 1,000 kilometers away. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with what Norm said. I don't think that we should spend a lot of time looking at how to make you it's know, small. models, how to individually say, okay, each model, how are we going to extend this model from you know, 400 kilometers to 1,000, or this one from 600 kilometers to 1,000. Okay. Those, uh, as Norm said, I think all we want is well-behaved extrapolations that aren't going to turn around and start increasing again. So I think that we should probably just come up with one standard, extrapolate it beyond the range model that's going to behave reasonably, and just say we're going to apply that to, to everything. Um, because it shouldn't matter the details of how you extrapolate something from 500 to 1,000 kilometers as long as you don't do something silly. Yeah, two comments. I, I agree with that, and I wanted to mention a couple of things. First, we only care about those distances for the long periods. Mm -hmm. So high frequencies, whatever. Yeah. Second, the data don't look very good at those distances. They, there are many, but they, they start going up doing strange things. It could be trucks passing by at the right time, during <laughs> the other time, who knows what. <laughs> Which is why, you know, a lot of the models, including many of ours, deliberately stop at something like 500 or 400 or 600, or is because the data get really yeah. crappy out beyond that. And yeah, so, signal to noise and is so really if you yeah. if you include the crappy data when you're fitting your model, then you're going to end up getting a, a, a bias in the entire model uh, because you've included this data which isn't very reliable. So um, following uh, Gabrielle's point, if, if it's really just the long periods, one could do something as simple as say, uh, beyond the largest distance that you're considering, whether it's 500 or 600 or whatever, you could just take R to the minus a half beyond that and be done with it. And uh, just extrapolate uh, all the models from, yeah. from that. Yeah. Okay. You know, with some nominal Q, just so that the higher mm -hmm. frequencies would look more reasonable. You could say, okay, you're going to take R to the minus a half and some typical Q like 500 F to the 0.5, and you're just going to say that's the decay for everything beyond 
500 kilometers. Okay, that's a good uh, point. Anything else for discussion? Okay, so um, Norm, are there already? Okay, so we have the summary of the day. Just go briefly over that. That's mine, okay. <laughs> and okay, so I'm I'm gonna try to type and you do we do that as a yeah, tag team? Yeah, yes, yeah. there you go. Okay, so yeah. Okay, um so again I'm trying to not summarize what was presented but what was discussed so we capture that. So if there's just not um, and what I, I want to be sure is as we go through this, if, if any of you had made a comment or brought something up that's not captured here, speak up so we can, um, Christine can add it. So just running through this from the start. So misclassified sites, uh, there's this issue of avoiding circular reasoning and taking the data and correcting the site characterization by the observations gets us really nowhere in time to do that. So we would just be trying to identify sites that should be really evaluated further. Maybe we could test alternative approaches for those sites, but we're not going to go and say adjust the VS30 value to match the, to make it fit the data better. Uh, one uh, suggestion, take it and see, check this out for sites with measured VS30 to see if um, those are any more consistent than the uh, uh, proxy method. Also using the over H, H over V ratios, I'm sorry, as well for these sites to see if they indicate, for example, there's a strong resonance or something that would show up that might indicate VS30 is just not a good way to characterize site response, you know, because there'll be some sites where it's not a, a good parameter to use. Uh, the other part was, are these um, scores of, of misclassification, I'll say here, or um, uh, anomalous site factors correlated in a region, so plot them spatially on a map and see if we can see any areas where they're all showing up in the same area that might tell us our, our way of getting at the scaling is wrong. Anything else from this morning on that? I know it's a while ago. John, did we forget anything that was brought up? No, that's it, huh? Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, how we're going to go about this uh, our approach that we described for the median. So um, we had some comments from Art about the backbone approach and the limitations of that. So individual models really don't follow a backbone approach. It does capture the amplitudes overall. Um, uh, this really affects the range of the hazard because hazard is, is summing things up. It's a, it's a linear process. So if I get it wrong, um, and I'll still recover the right mean hazard if I don't have the right slopes as long as the amplitudes are right, but the fractals and so forth will all be off. Um, so we're not planning to do backbone approach. Um, so the Salmon's map, again, though, one of the key assumptions on the Salmon's map is when we plot these things, that that space, that metric we're using of, of how similar are the models or how dissimilar are they, is the appropriate metric to be using. And so maybe we want to do binning for that? Uh, well, I think we need to think about this as opposed to just saying we're going to only be using the, the distance between the models. Um, and one way you could be saying let's, let's set weights that are more uh, or focus on parts of the models that are most important to the hazard. This is back to saying instead of going from one to a thousand kilometers, well, let's really look at, at a range that's most important or at least give the highest weight to that. There may be some other metric we could think about. And so I think, Nico, we need to think if there's, maybe try some and see if it makes much difference. So you could even be using an L1 norm instead of an L2 norm. There's a few other ways to be oh. looking at the problem. Okay, so I guess that was there already. Okay. okay. Cool. Next, so anything else on the method? You all, 
are familiar now with this. You've been seeing it for a while. You have one more evening. Art, to Art read. has a comment for that. Art, Is there a mic from Art? Can you turn that uh, do you think it would be useful to do a salmon map where the distance metric is based on hazard rather than ground motion? Yes. So that the short answer is that's probably the better way to do it. We just haven't done it that way as we are trying to make it a little separate from the hazard, but we could actually run one fully, fully doing that. We're partially doing that when for each cell we were choosing a representative model that had the mean hazard for that cell, so we're kind of getting there. But you're right, you could do the whole map based on hazard, and that might be uh, um, the approach we could try. Unless you're, I want to just capture what was discussed. Is there any other sort or other parts of this? Okay. Yeah, uh, this is Larry Salamone, uh, Joint Management Committee. Just a process question, I'm kind of stepping back. We have working groups in the project, so we did one for the database. We have a simulation working group where they qualified four methods. We have a geotechnical working group that worked with uh, the reference rock as well as the VS30. My question is, if we were to prepare a table with the models that we saw today and with the models that we'll see tomorrow, can we check boxes that they all use the NGAES database? Did they all use the work of the geotechnical working group to use the same correction? For example, we've heard Atkinson correction was used, but did everybody use the Atkinson correction? Um, and uh, you know, we'll get the Sigma you know, working group and the results of Linda. Um, are they all flowing into the final models that each of these developers are working, or should they? And, uh, and that is kind of, uh, before, before we get the answer of how well we did, like with a salmon map, you know, uh, to know how close they are, uh, that process check may be worthwhile just to, to see the, the guts of each of these uh, results. I think what we can talk about here is on our on our model selection, which mm -hmm. is sort of right at the before backbone approach, is the mm -hmm. selection that we should summarize the databases and and let's say other key assumptions like site corrections that were used in each of these methods, because some are going to be different. Yes, the, that's part of the epistemic uncertainty. But so, but even yeah. as we go collect other published models or models that were used, you know. Uh, other uh, projects, they will not have been based on this, but, but it's good to sim simply, yeah, I wouldn't call it a sanity check, I would say documentation on, on the databases yes. on which they're based and, and the assumptions that they make. Microphone, please. Okay. In, in the sense of your, in the case of your project plan, you had these working groups to do this work which essentially would facilitate and be available for use by the developers, and that's why I raise this. But that's good that you would do that uh, document, you know, how each of these developers use these parts. I would say they're available for the developers to use. We don't require them to use no. it. So um, they're, they're if Some people include potentially induced events, some won't. That's part of choices. That's like it was done in West 2. There's all kinds of different things, and if we required that, then we wouldn't consider any of the past models. I think so one, that's not. The yeah. one key thing we're trying to get to is that they are trying to predict the same site ground motion for the same site condition. We don't yeah. want that difference mapping into the range of ground motion models. Handle that, right? Wouldn't you say? Okay. Yes, how they handle the site correction is important. But you can get to 3,000 in different, different ways. Different ways. Right, and we wouldn't say only one way is, is, is allowed. Yes. Anything else on the approach? You'll get to see it again tomorrow. If you haven't already done so, read the little 
pictorial, or the, there's, um, there's text for those of you that like to read text, and then there's pictures for those of you who just want to flip through the pictures. Okay? Uh, it's really helpful. I think we're, uh, we've been explaining it to ourselves for a couple of years now, so at least um, internally we think we know what we're doing, and it would be, uh, I think, a big help for you tomorrow. If you read, read through this tonight, you'll be able to follow better what the discussions are. Okay. Uh, so if you only have time to look at one document, look at the one that's, uh, that looks like a slideshow. Pictures. It's, there's a lot of pictures, but also text that explains, and it's, uh, it's been shared with all the attendees. Yeah. Okay. Next. Cap, cap of value. So this is from uh, what um, Bob Dara talked about. So uh, they're, they're getting kappa for each of the six uh, geometrical spreading and Q models. They were similar for five, but different for one. But we're going to to keep these things separate, right, at this point, and 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 charge forward, treating kappa as one of the correlated sets of parameters that goes with all of the other models, uh, model parameters. Uh, there was discussion about the inversion or fitting changes the moment. This is somewhat the same thing that Gail was talking about of allowing an adjustment up and down. So if you're really after some of these factors, you don't want you don't want to try to force kappa, for example, to pick up the, the right scaling that you have overall. Um, but does this imply anything for our magnitudes? Uh, I still think that, I think that is a worthwhile question for us to be asking. If, if they have to crank it up to a higher magnitude, are we really confident in that? So, let, so we put here to check that the earthquakes that are getting significant changes in the moments from the inversion to see uh, if they're from a converted magnitude, which we would think is, is less reliable or more uncertain, or if they are actually from a moment inversion, and if so, really, what are we picking up here in terms of understanding why we need a big scale factor? Uh, and this is, should be in the source file that is to be re released soon, correct? Yes. In two weeks? Is no, before, I, I, yeah. this one, next week, I'm going to be bold. Next week. One week, all right. Okay. Uh, then how are we going to be using these kappa values? They, they're sort of not a standalone number that I think automatically fits into each of the methods. I'm not sure, but uh, we're back to these things are all correlated parameters that fit together to explain the data. And so we, I think, need to be aware of this as we start to charge forward. Yes. Anything else on kappa? Linda. Quick question: uh, Can you s just remind what? Speak really, speak loud. All right. What happened to the other kappa approach, the Anderson and Huff? We didn't say anything. About Hasn't it. been done yet. So but is it going to be done? Yes, but uh, can you clarify that the switch following the last workshop, what we're going to do with it? No, I don't remember. So. Okay. So <laughs> the idea is that. The, okay, so I'll summarize briefly. It was found from a project uh, using Arizona data that the two, the broadband inversion and the, the method by looking at each record individually gave reasonable similar results. So the broadband ver inversion is really fast and easier to get out to. So we're going to just select a subset of stations and just check that the, uh, the, uh, the conventional approach to estimating kappa is consistent with the broadband inversion. We're not going to do each record. So that's the bottom line of the change in scope. But it's going just, to get just, done. Just a question on that. So the records that you're checking, are they going to be records that are close to the source? Because that, to me, that's, that's a basic problem, is, is that if you're determining kappa from an inversion of a big data set, uh, once you get out past about 50 kilometers or something, it's, it's all Q and very little kappa. Yeah, so the, I mean, as Bob, they've been trying to collect uh, things that are close to the source first. So that's the, the idea, so you don't map up other effect, effects into it. Yeah, that's the short answer. To okay, that. so I think you can just put here um, Anderson Huff Kappas for a subset Check. of yeah. close in data to compare with. Anything else on Kappa while well, Christine's typing that up? Bob? Yes. 
Yeah, I should make uh, two clarification points. One thing is when we compute, um, we add in amplification factors. And if you look at one of the slides, you'll see there are amplification factors that go into the data that changes the, re changes the Fourier amplitude spectra. And we use that to compute the moment. We're putting in at one hertz for each size, factors of five. So the moment we come out is after we've done the site correction, the linear elastic site amplification correction. And at one hertz, even for a C, it's like a factor of 1.3 or 2. Yeah. So the moment we're getting, um, I got in trouble with using stress drop. So I'd say it's a moment parameter and a stress parameter in the inversion method. They're not that tightly linked to both moment right. and stress drop. And they, they go with your assumed amplification yes. factors. Is That's what correct. You're okay. That's so put in there. And when seismologists do moments at seismographic stations, they're not including your source amplification when they do their moments. And we also have limited, limited station selection. A lot of other things go into that. OK, great. Thanks, Bob. Anything else? All right. OK, moving next, on. Next one. All right, so just we'll run through the GMPEs pretty quickly. Um, uh, I think that's we, more a summary slide. Yeah, right? so, well, I, for me it was things that I didn't quite get from the presentation, but now I understand it a little better. So this is basically a model that allows us to go simply to adjusting for parameters without going back and rerunning the model again. Right? It kind of magically creates for us what we need. Okay. Um, da, da, da. The other part was the adjustment to 3,000 meters per second. Right now we have one to 1,500, and you need to decide if that is what you're going to apply for the 3,000 as well. Okay, another part is the Gulf Coast definition is a little different in what, you, in what was used in this analysis, but um, again, looking at the uh, um, Later presentation, you had um, not much difference in the east versus that your Gulf Coast or your central region anyway. Okay, but right now we do have a bit of a, a disconnect between the region boundaries that are being used by the different models. Anything else for this method? It's both. They we, provided both. They, they gave us a 1,500 that we're now, I think, using or mm -hmm. comparing with, but, but we didn't use a separate one all the way to 3,000. Well, yeah. So it still needs to be done. Okay. Okay. Next. SM SIM model. Uh, da, da, da. So the duration isn't calibrated. The key thing for me was from the PSA values, but it's, it's consistent with SM SIM durations, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is what I think Gail was talking about. Evaluating geometrical sprain should allow for a shift or a constant factor to isolate attenuation. Okay. Uh, why the large difference in the magnitude scaling for the Silva O2 models compared to the other ones? We need to really figure this out. That's, um, I'm still really uncomfortable with that difference. Um, and the question is really coming down to are we using effective distance in a consistent way? in terms of how uh, um, Dave implemented in the SM SIM and how it's intended to do it. So I put at the bottom there, it's probably useful for us to go through the effective distance metrics and compare them and make sure those things are all being done in, a, in an internally consistent way. Okay. Anything else on this set of models? No. Moving on. Moving on. Uh, so I guess one of the issues here was the saturation versus no saturation models, and if that's trading off with magnitude dependence of the stress drop or some other term. So I think we have to um, uh, figure that out. Also consider using an RUP based model instead of RJB. We're finding a hard time making the RJB models work for some of the smaller magnitudes in the um, close-in data. So. Uh, you're probably, we're probably going to find we can't make our rep models work very well. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. This first bullet goes to the previous slide. This one. Yeah, they go together. They but go, 
Do you want us to move that? Uh, it doesn't. Well. No, that they're they're it's probably put in put in there twice. I agree. That's really the okay. other one. I'll put it here. It okay. Next one. Okay. That so? Okay. Norm. Mr. Bob, did you you just said that you were having a hard time making the R rep models work? meant RJV models work. RJV, it's a typo. No, he, he, a verbal typo. Yeah, ver verbal typo. I'm sorry, a verbal typo, yes. Yeah. The, the RJV models are, are with, especially with some of the shallower events, are having a harder time getting it all to, to work, and it is a better fit we're seeing on the RUP based model. Um, so, uh, let me see here. So this is all back to that saturation. Is there really magnitude dependent stress drop greater than magnitude five, or is it just a different way of getting at the uh, saturation that could be modeled separately? Um, using NGA West 2 data to constrain the slope. Let's see, that's nice saturation. And then consider using, I guess, updating the duration model is what uh, Dave was saying. Um, and that, Dave, just but from observed data, is that how you want them to update it? The duration model, they had the Herman model from the 0.05. Linda, can you use the mic? Oh. I just pointed out the 0.05 isn't, uh, isn't based on data. Okay, it's something that people use for years without even thinking about it or checking it. The, uh, the duration that, that we were using was based on data. It was not based, however, on um, finding the duration that would uh, produce the response spectrum. That's what Nico was doing. And so it would be real interesting to see how his durations compare to the ones we got. So just looking at the duration issue, but it could be with data or other approaches. Sorry. For but but this is telling Bob to go update that part of their model, yes. right? There was a question mark whether he should consider it. I'm saying yes. Yes. <laughs> Remove the question mark. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, same issue as the Gulf Coast, but it didn't show up as a difference, so I think this isn't a big deal. Um, let's see. So fundamentally, we're taught we had a large, dis long discussion about this model says the ground motions close, you know, within 50 kilometers and less than 5 hertz are the same between California or the west and the east. That's a, sort of their fundamental observation and attributing anything at higher frequencies to stress drop. Uh, I'm still wondering if there's a trade-off with kappa and stress drop that could both explain those high frequency scaling. And then there was the issue of, well, is this observation um, that they're similar between east and west close in? Uh, at lower than five hertz, is that consistent with the intensity data that's seen in the east? Is that would imply the intensities are coming from the higher frequency range to be able to, to have an intensity difference? Um, and so I think that's just something for us to think through here. Distance limitations we just talked about right at the, um, the end anyway, that we won't try to extrapolate individual models. We will build a simple and reasonable extrapolation that's applied to all models as, as, as they go from, let's say, beyond 400 kilometers. I like that. Moving on. Uh, oh, sorry, is there anything else? Did we miss anything else? <laughs> Someone wants to get out of here really fast. Okay, next one. We're almost there, right? So um, hybrid empirical, like it would be good to see if they're getting a similar conclusion as, as what Gail had that... Um, uh, there's not a, a large difference between at short distances and less than five hertz. So just to plot the ratio and let's see what that looks like from these models. Um, hence durations, we talked whether those should be similar for both the duration and the geometrical spreading. And I think the discussion said yes, if it's related to durations or related to critical reflections. Is that what the discussion was? 
I think there was something you had said, Gail, that yes, there's a reason why you would think those were there. It would. It, it also could be yes, depending on how duration was calculated. Right? If duration uses some ways of calculating duration, have implicitly used that geometric spreading, and that duration is calculated from the model. So just put there yes, um, or right above there, in parentheses, depends how duration was calculated. I, I thought that uh, Sharam, uh, while I type, I'm going to try to talk. Um, you said that when you tested, it didn't matter in the end. Is that, did I gather that from your presentation? That when you, that whether you, you match or not didn't matter? Uh, when we use different models and I plot them on top of each other, they look close. So the hinge point uh, for trilinear and the bilinear that we had came out to be close. Okay, so I think okay. it's not a, not a significant issue. Yeah, exactly. So uh, that's not uh, high, you know. Okay, so it looks like there are some, some residuals that look like very large values near minus five, for example. That might be outliers. So I think it's worth going back to the data and seeing if you want to chop some of those out because that's running at six or seven sigmas, which is not likely to be happening. And binet with magnitude, right? Is that? A smaller magnitude or larger magnitude? We have written on the last plot the plot log distance to focus on short distances and bin by magnitude, right? And so then we're that's okay. This is that there was a bias at short distances in their model mm -hmm, that they're mm -hmm. going to work through. And the question was whether. And bin by magnitude, yeah. Yeah, but is that due to geometrical spreading between east and west? So mm -hmm. try it with the same geometrical spreading. And, may, and see if, the, if that makes the bias go away, then you've got a, a path forward. And um, could we get all the GMP developers to use the natural log for the residuals so that it's easier for us? To, Norm does conversions all the time in my head. It's natural to use the natural yeah. log. So I'm actually pointing at Gail here. So future presentations use log 10 sometimes. Uh, Okay, well, I'll talk in private with her. Okay, okay next, that sounds good. <laughs> next, anything else on the hybrid empirical model? And I didn't capture anything on the on the um, hybrid empirical finite fault, but I think that, that seemed to be working, right? They're looking good, so. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, but we, yes, we didn't. So I think that if for the TI team to better understand and evaluate it, it will be good for us to have a paper that's, or that's presentation. That's written up is what you've described, right? So yeah. I think we can start by or reading it. Or the steps yeah. of presentations will be useful. Okay. Frank Last goes. one. So we talked a bit about the <clears> top <throat> five kilometers. Why is it limited to that uh, or not, not shallower than four or five kilometers? Seems to work. Avoid building up large surface ways. Avoid having to add some other explanation. Um, but in the end, uh, as John um, Adams pointed out, there are earthquakes with ruptures in hard rock at shallow ruptures, so we can't say they don't happen. Our model needs to apply to that in some way and be able to, to use it. Whether we make the simulations address it directly or not, the models need to extrapolate properly. So maybe just put hmm. that models okay. have to extrapolate to this shallow rupture. Uh, was just some questions people were asking about velocity, rupture velocity, how you got the, the static stress drop used is not optimized, but it's giving a reasonable result. Is that a fair way to put that? Okay. Uh, and this concept of apparent geometrical spreading sounded like a useful thing for us to be thinking about as opposed to, yes, it, it is a geometrical spreading, but these are really apparent parameters that we're using. And that the same apparent geometrical spreading may not apply at all frequencies. I think that's it. Anything we missed for Art's presentation? All right. Okay, so uh, we have a quick time for uh, observers, uh, observers' comments, uh, and uh, yes. Yeah. So please uh, state your name and go ahead. David Williams. Uh, 
Um, coming from the end, what's that right in front of you? Is that better, David Williams? Yeah. Coming from the end user um, perspective, uh, it, well, it just, I've got two, two um, comments. On the purely... Can you, if this is that. directional. Oh, I'm sorry, is that better? Yeah. yeah. Hey. <laughs> I'm learning. Um, from the purely stochastic simulations, uh, the um, Canadian uh, presentation, sorry, uh, Emra and Gail, uh, there was a C value that you had, uh, you said it was going a little skew with at three seconds, but you were showing results for 10 seconds. As an end user, um, a large percentage of end users will be more interested in the long period than the high frequency range. Maybe not if you're doing nuclear power plant, that's where you may be interested more, but this will be used by people doing time domain analyses in the long period. And so whether it is really three seconds or it's valid out to 10 seconds is very important. Um, the simulation, this is a comment on um, simulations for nonlinear models, um, if you're looking at this, using the synthetic, the stochastic based, um, purely stochastic based uh, time domain records that make up the simulation, you typically get results totally unlike using real earthquakes. I suspect the, the hybrid synthetic that um, Art uh, presented give you much more realistic or time domain. One other perspective, the last observational comment is, sorry, the last observational comment is more from the scientific viewpoint. All of the data from what I can gather today is being treated as um, time invariant, that the stochastic processes or whatever are stationary. And do you ever consider the non-stationarity, if this is the beginning of a long process, whether or not climate change or anything like that is going to do anything to change the, model, the, um, the, the physical processes tectonically. When we're looking at storm, uh, hurricane data and what have you, it is non-stationary. That's, that's the last comment. I think starting with your last comment on the time scales we're worried about over geologic time in our 100 years type of exposure, we're in a stationary process for earthquake generation. Other than rates of earthquakes or people injecting wastewater, okay, that's a separate problem for us. But, but, but the wave propagation through the earth and those types of things is, is constant for us. It is purely the pi, the, the, it, it, it was sea level rise, whether reservoir-induced earthquake effect induced seismicity. And you were worried about the whole process being too simple at the beginning, if I remember not. So I'm just trying to complicate it a little. So I think most of that is affecting the rates of earthquakes as opposed to what is the ground motion that comes once we say an earthquake mm -hmm. occurs. So our problem is a little easier than the source characterization. The, I think you had other comments on, on time histories and so forth, but again, luckily for us, that's, that's out of our scope. We just got to get the amplitude. Yeah. Larry Salamone, Joint Management Committee. Um, Norm, uh, when you look ahead and you look at the number of models you're going to end up with, do you see uh, any uh, concern about uh, the complexity for the end users to apply the NGA East model? No. Short answer, no. right? Bob said, I heard Bob said no, and he's going to be one of the end users. I, th there's I probably a couple of, of ways. I, I am envisioning Simpler. numbers like 30 models, but we may also say if you're only going to do five, here is what they would be with adjusted weights. I mean, we could do something like that. Okay, that, that's what I was asking. That would be for different types of projects. There, not may, for the be, there may be end users not in this room today. Yes, but we're trying to develop. Yeah, one question. It'll be yeah. 30 million models, right? Plot times, uh, how many sigma models, etc. Right? Times hanging wall. Yes. Yeah, that's okay. 
it doesn't have to be every oh, combination, right. so we can do some other sampling. I, I think at the most on the sigmas we'll have three, right? Probably something like that again. To, so we will be keeping it manageable. Linda, you get three. That's it, right? <laughs> Sigma is one third, <laughs> one tenth. Monte Carlo, yeah. <laughs> okay, one last comment because we're running out of time. Uh, Microphone, Jim. Um, James Bula, Oregon Earthquake Awareness. Um, as an end user, I believe we should be talking about attenuation and not GMPE. The problem is not precise language. The problem is clear language. GMPE has the undesirable effect that engineers in reviewing and determining earthquake design load considerations will interpret this to be the actual ground motions they are designing for. And since building codes do not actually design for earthquake ground motions, they only tell you do this to achieve this strength, the more frequently this fact is remembered and actually considered, the more it tips the design process back into more judgment, which has become quite lax in recent code evolutions. Um, believe you should bend the attenuation relationships magnitude six to seven, seven to eight, and eight plus, and actually show the actual complete response spectra as it changes over distance. Uh, it seems to me that our rough breaks down when you go from a point source to a large magnitude aerial sources. And while there's no progress without change, all change isn't progress. When we hire a worker to work in an Oregon brewery, we tell them we expect you to solve more problems than you create. These NGA models have already caused more problems than they have solved, unless I guess you're a model creator. They reduced the design strength in central Virginia by 30% before the mineral Virginia earthquake in 2011, and now they have lowered the threshold for what should now be considered a trigger for addressing an earthquake prone building. Finally, it just seems to me there are too many terms for source, path, and side effects, which are probably more in the realm of such factors than physical realities. Is that the end? I think we're at the end of the day. All right, we are officially adjourned. Um, Actually, so we, we need to Five minutes over. we need to get people out of the room as soon as possible. Please so just get out. So tomorrow, <laughs> hold on a second. Tomorrow morning there's a breakfast at 8:30. Uh, we start. I'm sorry. We start okay, at so 8. Retry. Okay. Tomorrow the meeting starts at 8. We will have breakfast here, so please come here and enjoy it here, and we'll start at 8. And breakfast says that. Breakfast seven. is at seven ish. Seven ish. And uh, so if people can leave the room so we can have our private meeting with the PPRP. Youssef, did you have anything to. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's run that test thing. right now. Uh, I don't have it here. You don't have it on this one? No, uh, it needs to be installed. Uh, okay, then forget it. Proceed. No, but I mean, sure. Uh, oh, okay, you can just. Because it's a Mac, it's going to be the same. Okay. Just I thought you might love me. It was Y E. So the Y E. Where? Oh, that's the, yeah, okay, I'll fix it. Okay. Yeah. Just, there you go. Y E and I, I know, okay. Yeah. I didn't catch it. I'm just kidding. Uh, let's try that here. you. Ah, oh, really? Did I? Oh, I even sent an email to apologize. Uh, uh test is, uh, is cool. Okay, let's look at that. Okay, open it. It's, yeah, but it's hard. It's a projector problem. Yes. Yeah. You can see the curves, but you can't see the different colors if you click. Because it's... Yeah, just make it... Uh, make it. Um.
can you lower the lights just uh, for 30 seconds? Uh, I can make the lights thicker then. Yeah, thicker. Okay, thank you. That's fine. You can bring them back up. Yeah, okay. Okay, I think I'll, if, I'll if it's easy to make them all thicker. No, yeah. Well, that's a problem. That's why it's interactive. That's why we add and remove. But at some time, at some point, we'll have them all. That's part of the. What we're trying to show. Yeah, but that's, that's, that's the presentation. It's interactive. Yes. Okay, so so I guess I need to install this player on the other laptop. Okay, ladies, thank you so much. Um, no, you gave me all the slides. I have the last one. What else? If you can help us. Uh, Do you have a suitcase here? Usually we have the suitcase with the gizmo. Is it somewhere here? So Sahar, you know what I'm talking about, right?